investigate drug use by professional athletes. Visit CapitalNews.org and cast your vote. Now today's hearing on the use of steroids and other performance enhancing drugs by Major League Baseball players. This is the second hearing by the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee following a report by former Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell naming players accused of using such substances. Henry Waxman of California is the chairman. This is four hours. The uh, committee will please come to order. Before we begin our hearing, the chair wants to make some personal statements and statements on behalf of all of our colleagues about the seat that is next to me that is vacant. That seat was occupied by Representative Tom Lantos, who passed away this week. Those of us who have worked with Tom Lantos over the years know about his deep commitment and compassion his integrity and his leadership, not only on behalf of his constituents, but the people of this country and around the world. He was a champion for human rights. He was a member of this committee, but he was also chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I think it's appropriate that, as a longtime member of this committee and a very esteemed member of Congress, that we recognize him and have a moment of silence. But before I call for that, moment of silence. I'd like to represent, re recognize Mr. Davis. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Having survived unalterable inhumanity, Tom Lantos spent the rest of his life giving voice to the ideals of human rights and freedom. His keen intellect, indomitable spirit, and wry insights left an indelible mark on all that he touched. We are grateful to have known him. He will be missed, but not forgotten. And we take solace in the Hebrew lesson there are stars whose light only reaches the earth long after they have fallen apart. There are people whose remembrance gives light in this world long after they have passed away. Their light shines in our darkest nights on the road we must follow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And if you would all just please uh, remember him in a moment of silence. This is our second hearing on Senator Mitchell's report on the illegal use of steroids and other performance enhancing substances by players in Major League Baseball. This hearing is focused on the accuracy of an important section of that report, the section that is based on the information that strength and fitness coach Brian McNamee provided to Senator Mitchell. This committee has a special connection to the Mitchell Report. In 2005, when Representative Tom Davis was our chairman, the two of us urged Commissioner Selig to investigate baseball's history with performance-enhancing substances. 
The Commissioner agreed with our suggestion and appointed Senator George Mitchell to lead that effort. Senator Mitchell's report is impressive and credible. He concluded that the use of performance enhancing substance was pervasive for more than a decade and that everyone in baseball, the players, the union, the owners and the commissioner were responsible for the scandal. Senator Mitchell released his report on December 13th. That same day, this committee announced a hearing with Senator Mitchell, Commissioner Selig, baseball player union rep, uh, leader Don Fear. We intended for that hearing to close the chapter on looking at baseball's past. On the same day the Mitchell report was released, however, Roger Clemens, through his attorney Rusty Hardin, publicly challenged the accuracy of the section of the report that presented evidence of his use of steroids and human growth hormone. Mr. Hardin later told the committee that the Mitchell report is a horrible, disgraceful report. Given the committee's past work and our interest in an accurate record of baseball's steroid era, we have investigated the evidence in Senator Mitchell's report that relates to Mr. McNamee and the players he identified. Tom Davis and I made this decision reluctantly. We have no interest in making baseball a central part of our committee's agenda. But if the Mitchell report is to be the last word on baseball's past, we believed we had a responsibility to investigate a serious claim of inaccuracy. The committee's inquiry and this hearing are focused on the accuracy of the Mitchell report as it relates to information provided by Brian McNamee. Mr. Davis and I both believe that this narrow focus is important. We have carefully limited our inquiry to the relevant facts regarding Mr. McNamee's interactions with three players he claims to have supplied with these substances. In the course of this investigation, we have been able to probe more deeply than Senator Mitchell could. Senator Mitchell could only ask for information and had no power to subpoena documents or to insist that individuals talk to him. As the Chief Investigative Committee in the House of Representatives, we have greater authority and have been able to consider evidence that was not available to Senator Mitchell. I will now summarize some of the information our investigation has uncovered. Based on the information that Brian McNamee provided Senator Mitchell, he reported that Chuck Knobloch used human growth hormone in 2001. According to the report, quote, beginning during spring training and continuing through the early portion of the season, McNamee injected Knobloch at least seven to nine times with human growth hormone. Mr. Knobloch voluntarily met with the committee on February 1 and told us that Mr. McNamee was accurate when he told Senator Mitchell that Mr. McNamee had injected him with human growth hormone. Mr. Knobloch also told us about additional injections of human growth hormone that were not reported by Senator Mitchell. Mr. Knobloch told us that he administered HGH injections to himself in 2002. There is no mention of these injections in Senator Mitchell's report or in any published account. In a moving part of his deposition, Mr. Knobloch said, my son was here today and I'm trying not to get emotional about this, but I am trying to teach him a lesson that you need to do things in life that you are going to be willing to talk about openly and to tell the truth. On behalf of the committee, I want to thank Mr. Knobloch for his cooperation and for his candor in accepting responsibility for his actions. Based on the information Mr. McNamee provided, Senator Mitchell also reported that Andy Pettit used human growth hormone. Mr. McNamee has known Mr. Pettit since 1999 and has worked as his personal fitness coach. According to the Mitchell report, Mr. McNamee recalled that he injected Pettit with human growth hormone on two to four occasions in 2002. Andy Pettit voluntarily met with the committee for a sworn deposition on February 4 and told the committee 
that the information that Mr. McNamee provided to Senator Mitchell was accurate. In addition, Mr. Pettit told the committee about a second time he used gro human growth hormone. This occurred in 2004 when Mr. Pettit injected himself twice with HGH when he was recovering from an injury. Mr. Pettit had never told anyone outside of his family about this incident, but he volunteered it during the deposition because he wanted to provide a complete record to the committee. Mr. Pettit also provided additional information of particular relevance to this hearing, which I'll describe later in my statement. On behalf of the committee, I want to commend Mr. Pettit for his cooperation. He found himself in an extremely uncomfortable position, but he did the right thing and told the truth. During his deposition, he was asked how he approached this difficult situation, and he said, quote, I have to tell you the truth, and one day I have to give an account to God and not to nobody else about what I've done in my life, and that's why I've said and shared the stuff that I wouldn't like to share with you all, end quote. Mr. Pettit's consistent honesty makes him a role model on and off the field. And finally, based on the information that Brian McNamee provided, Senator Mitchell reported that Roger Clemens used human growth hormone, hormone and steroids. Brian McNamee told Senator Mitchell then on over 20 occasions he injected Roger Clemens with either human growth hormone or steroids. All of us from time to time can have memory lapses. If any of us were asked to recall a specific incident or event that occurred 10 years ago, we might get the substance right, but we'd be off on some details. I think most of us can relate to that. It's rare, however, to have the situation the committee faces today. Mr. Clemens and Mr. McNamee have both cooperated fully with us and both have given us sworn statements. They both insist that they are telling the truth, but their accounts couldn't be more different. They don't disagree on a phone call or one meeting. They disagree on whether over a, four, whether over a period of four years, Mr. McNamee repeatedly injected Mr. Clemens with steroids and human growth hormone. It's impossible to believe that this is a simple misunderstanding. Someone isn't telling the truth. If Mr. McNamee is lying, then he has acted inexcusably and he has made Mr. Clemens an innocent victim. If Mr. Clemens isn't telling the truth, then he has acted shamefully and has smeared Mr. McNamee. I don't think there's anything in between. After we had completed our depositions, my instinct was to cancel this hearing and issue a written report. We've learned about, a lot about Mr. McNamee's allegations and Mr. Clemens' account, and I thought a bipartisan report setting out the facts with Mr. Davis might be the most effective way to present the results of our investigation. But others had different views, and I was particularly influenced by the view of Mr. Clemens' attorneys who thought it would be unfair if the committee issued a report without giving Mr. Clemens the opportunity to testify in public. So I decided to proceed with this hearing, which I expect will be the last hearing this committee will have on baseball's past or the Mitchell report. In today's hearing, Mr. McNamee's credibility will be bolstered by the testimony the committee received from Mr. Knobloch and Mr. Pettit in their depositions. Mr. Net McNamee named three players in the Mitchell Report, Mr. Knobloch, Mr. Pettit, and Mr. Clemens. None of these players talked with Senator Mitchell, but now two of them have told us under oath that Mr. McNamee told the truth as it related to them. Senator Mitchell told us in our January 15th hearing that two other factors supported Mr. McNamee's credibility. First, he said that the only penalty Mr. McNamee faced in dealing with federal prosecutors was perjury, which meant that he faced legal jeopardy only if he lied. And second, Mr. McNamee, McNamee was being paid by Mr. Clemens in 2007, as he had been paid for many years. And he had an economic interest against implicating the individual who supported his livelihood 
and was his most prominent client. On the other hand, the committee learned that Mr. McNamee has twice failed to tell the government uh, investigators the full truth. There was an incident in Florida in 2001 that is not related to the matter before us, but relates to Mr. McNamee's credibility. We are not going to make that incident part of today's hearing, but Mr. Davis and I have prepared a joint statement that will be part of today's record. We are stipulating for the record that Mr. McNamee lied to police officers when they investigated the matter. Mr. McNamee does not dispute that he lied, but told us he did it to protect others. Mr. McNamee was never charged in that case. Of more direct relevance to this matter, it's clear from our deposition with Mr. McNamee that he didn't tell federal prosecutors everything he knew. In his deposition, Mr. McNamee acknowledged that he misled prosecutors about the number of injections he gave Mr. Knobloch and Mr. Clemens. Until last month, he also withheld from the prosecutors physical evidence that he says implicates Mr. Clemens. Mr. McNamee says he did not tell the full, full truth because he and I quote him, I was trying not to hurt the guy. I felt awful for being in the situation I put myself into. There was a feeling of betrayal. I shouldn't have done it, but I didn't want to hurt him as bad as I could, end quote. That's no excuse. It's a serious matter that Mr. McNamee did not tell the investigators the full truth. We need to keep this in mind in evaluating his credibility today. Mr. Clemens has visited with many committee members personally in the last few days. One point he and his attorneys have made is that it would make no sense for him to testify under oath if he actually used steroids. In judging his credibility, the risk that he takes by testifying today needs to be taken into account. It's also relevant that Mr. Clemens is a credible and convincing person. I'm also aware of the tremendous amount of good that Mr. Clements has done through the Roger Clements Foundation, and I thank you for helping so many children. But it is also true that as we move forward in our investigation, we found conflicts and inconsistencies in Mr. Clements' account. During his deposition, he made statements we know are untrue, and he made them with the same earnestness that many of the committee members observed in person when he visited your offices. In other areas, his statements are contradicted by other credible witnesses or simply implausible. At the beginning of his sworn deposition, Mr. Clemens repeatedly told the committee that he never talked with Brian McNamee about human growth hormone. We know from his later testimony that these statements were false. Mr. Clemens told the committee that Mr. McNamee injected him with a dangerous pain medication, lit lidocaine, in a public area of a team training room. Dr. Ron Taylor, the team doctor, Melvin Craig, the team trainer, both told the committee that this account does not make any sense. During his interview on 60 Minutes, Mr. Clemens asserted that Mr. McNamee didn't tell me a word about the Mitchell report, and he lambasted Mr. McNamee for sending him an email about fishing equipment a week before the release of the report. Well, these statements were not accurate. Eight days before the release of the Mitchell report, Mr. McNamee called Mr. Clemens representatives and told them about the report. Mr. McNamee also allowed Mr. Clemens investigators to interview him at length about the evidence in the Mitchell report before the release of the report. We know this happened because those investigators secretly taped the interview. There is also a direct conflict between Mr. Clemens' testimony and Mr. Pettit's. During his deposition, Mr. Pettit told the committee that in 1999 or 2000, Mr. Clemens, quote, told me he had taken HGH, end quote. During his deposition, Mr. Pettit was asked whether he had any doubt about that recollection. And he said, quote, I mean, no, he told me that. End quote. Mr. Clemens said this Mr. Clemens said this conversation never took place. 
Mr. Pettit also said he had a second conversation with Mr. Clemens about HGH in 2005. This conversation took place after the committee's hearings on steroids in baseball when Mr. Pettit asked Mr. Clemens what would he say about the HGH use if asked. According to Mr. Pettit, Mr. Clemens said, I never told you that. I told you that Debbie used HGH, end quote. Debbie Clemens is Mr. Clemens' wife. Well, we learned through our depositions of Mr. Clemens and Mr. McNamee that Mr. Clemens did inject Mr. Clemens, Mr. McNamee did inject Mr. Clemens' wife with HGH. Mr. Clemens and Mr. McNamee give completely different accounts of this injection. Mr. Clemens says that Mr. McNamee injected Mrs. Clemens without his knowledge. Mr. McNamee says that Mr. Clemens asked him to inject Mrs. Clemens. What they do agree upon, however, is that these injections occurred in 2003. That makes it impossible that Mr. Clemens, when he spoke to Mr. Pettit in 1999 or 2000, could have been referring to these injections of, Mr. of Mrs. Clemens. Mr. Pettit also told the committee that he talked about both of these conversations with his wife. Because of the relevance of this evidence to the committee's investigation, the committee asked Mr. Pettit and his wife to submit affidavits to the committee. And this is an excerpt of what Mr. Pettit wrote, and I'm quoting. In 1999 or 2000, I had a conversation with Roger Clemens in which Roger told me he had taken human growth hormone. This conversation occurred at his gym in Memorial, Texas. He did not tell me where he got the HGH or from whom, but he did tell me that it helped the body recover. I told my wife, Laura, about the conversation with Roger soon after it happened. In 2005, around the time of the congressional hearing into the use of performance-enhancing drugs in baseball, I had a conversation with Roger Clemens in Kissimmee, Florida. I asked him what he would say if asked by reporters if he ever used performance-enhancing drugs. When he asked what I meant, I reminded him that he had told me that he had used HGH. Roger responded by telling me that I must have misunderstood him. He claimed that it was his wife, Debbie, who used HGH. I said, OK, oh, OK, or words to that effect, not because I agreed, but because I wasn't going to argue with him. Shortly after, I, after that, I told my wife, Laura, about the second conversation with Roger about HGH and his comment about his wife. That's what Mr. Pettit told us in his affidavit. And this is what his wife, Mrs. Pettit, wrote. Quote, in 1999 or 2000, Andy told me he had a conversation with Roger Clemens in which Roger admitted to him using human growth hormone. A few years later, I believed in 2005, Andy again told me of a conversation with Roger Clemens about HGH. Andy told me that he had been thinking that if a reporter asked him he would tell the reporter of his own use of HGH in 2002. He said that he told Roger Clemens this and asked Roger what he would say if asked. Andy told me that in this 2005 conversation, Roger denied using HGH and told Andy that Andy was mistaken about their earliest conversation. According to Andy, Roger said that it was his wife, Debbie, who used HGH." End quote. Well, we'll sort through all of this today. I suspect we'll find inconsistencies in both Mr. Clemens and Mr. McNamee's accounts, and each member will have to reach his or her own, his or her own conclusions. These conclusions should not be based on whether we like or dislike Mr. McNamee or like or dislike Mr. Clemens. Our conclusions must be on the facts. During the course of our investigation, we've acquired a considerable amount of relevant evidence. We've taken the depositions of Mr. Clemens, Mr. Pettit, Mr. McNamee. We've conducted transcribed interviews of Mr. Knobloch, several tr team trainers and doctors, and Jim Murray, a representative of Mr. Clemens. We've received emails, communications, and transcripts of tape recordings. 
We've also received affidavits and declarations from several witnesses. Ranking Member Davis and I have agreed to make this evidence part of the hearing record with appropriate redactions to protect personal privacy. I know given the nature of this hearing that our witnesses have strong feelings, and I suspect that some committee members may share these. I want to caution both the witnesses and the members. The Chair will not tolerate any outbursts or defamatory comments at this hearing. This is an unusual hearing, but we've tried to be as fair as we can throughout this investigation, and I'm determined that this hearing will also be conducted in the fairest way possible for everyone. I'd like to now recognize uh, Tom Davis for his opening statement. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just hear the bells ring. Let me ask, we may be interrupted frequently today with mm -hmm. uh, uh, votes. I think there's some chaos on the floor, which isn't uncommon. Uh, I'm willing to sit through uh, the hearing, if you are, yes. um, and, and pair each other on motions to adjourn and dilatory motions, if that would be okay with the Chairman. Well, the, members can make their well, the two of us will pass up those uh, votes that are procedural. Members will use their own judgment and guidance as to whether they will join us in missing those votes. But the, con the hearing will continue. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for holding this hearing today, and thank you for reminding us all why we are here today. It gives me no joy to have joined you in calling this hearing. We were faced with an unenviable choice. Allow a strenuous challenge to the Mitchell Report to stand without review or open ourselves up to criticism that we are grandstanding, that we are acting like self-appointed prosecutors trying the claims of that report. In the end, we decided we had a duty to probe the challenge that we needed to help determine whether the Mitchell Report with its 409-page sordid picture of backroom drug deals and players injecting each other with illegal substances right in their locker rooms, whether that report could and should still stand as proof positive that baseball's efforts to combat illegal drug use needs a fresh look. Our hearing yesterday was a helpful reminder of the importance of our work. We learned how those attempting to sell HGH are scamming consumers and breaking the law. We learned of the terrible risks associated with unapproved use. We learned yet again of the dangerous and phony messages being sent to young athletes that there are magic pills and wonder drugs that can grease their path to the Hall of Fame. So while today's hearing may be awkward and joyless, we know why we are here. We are here to again try to disrupt and discredit the crass messages aimed at our children. We can't be arbitrators of credibility, at least not this soon after gathering evidence. We can't be lured into attaching a coefficient of credibility to different witnesses. We can only collect facts and present them as completely and dispassionately as possible. Today we will let the American people judge who is to be believed in this unfortunate battle of wills, memories and reputations. Coming into today's hearing, we have before us two very different stories. They are in many ways incompatible. Someone is lying in spectacular fashion about the ultimate question. But we have not prejudged, nor should anyone tuning in today prejudge. Let us listen to the witnesses. Let us probe disparities and contradictions. Let us remain fair and objective. And then let us decide whether anything we have learned leaves the Mitchell Report in a less glowing light than it has thus far enjoyed. As we did in January, we want to commend Senator Mitchell for his work. He was settled with a daunting task and list of obstacles, no subpoena power, little cooperation from players and only tepid enthusiasm among owners more concerned with filling seats than protecting public health. He produced a sober, even-handed document whose factual assertions, with little exception, have remained unchallenged. Today we offer a stage to the primary most vocal challenger. What better way to further examination of the strength of the Mitchell Report than to offer someone of Roger Clemens' stature the chance to tell his story and have that story in turn examined as well? Mr. Clemens, because of the scrutiny he has received, because of his accomplishments and profile, because of the good work his foundation has done for many years, deserves this opportunity. And so does his former friend, trainer and now accuser Brian McNamee. At our first hearing on January 15th, we learned from Senator Mitchell that players were required to consent to an interview before seeing the evidence against them. And they couldn't simply appear, review the evidence and leave if they concluded they had nothing further to say. It is not hard to imagine why players like Roger Clemens might have opted to remain mum under this scenario. Today is his chance to speak free of these constraints yet under oath and before a multitude of interested observers. We will ask our witnesses about the contradictions, open threads and mysteries we have uncovered through interviews, depositions and document review. We will find out if witnesses are sticking to their stories. We will probably discover that some lines of inquiry are red herrings. 
will undoubtedly learn things that are new to us and perhaps we will end up as confused and as uncertain as ever. But reaching consensus on whether the Mitchell Report is now sullied does not require us to reach firm conclusions or judgments on the veracity of our witnesses today. Factual resolution, whether through exoneration or heightened skepticism, need not be our goal. Today's testimony and questioning may not be tidy. Our hearing may not end up wrapped in a neat package and may not fit the storyline anticipated by many and hoped for by some. That is okay. I think we will have heard and learned enough to soon conclude whether we can return to the process of implementing the best of Senator Mitchell's recommendations. This is not a court of law. The guilt or innocence of the players accused in this report and of the accusers is not our concern. Our focus is and has been on Senator Mitchell's recommendations more than his findings. We are here to save lives, not ruin careers. Why? Because the health of young athletes across the country is at stake and we won't hesitate to defend their interests even if the process isn't always pretty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, by agreement, we will proceed uh, without objection in questioning in the following way after the witnesses presented their testify, uh, testimony. One 15-minute round for both the majority and the minority, controlled by the chairman and the ranking member. Two 10-minute rounds for both the majority and the minority, uh, controlled by the chairman and the ranking member. Um, Gentlemen, um, we welcome you to our hearing today. We appreciate your, your being here. It is the it's the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us uh, testify under oath. Uh, so uh, the chair would like to ask the three of you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will receive, you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The Chair will note for the record that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, there are only two of you who will be making opening statements. Mr. Sheeler is here to uh, answer questions. We will give each of the witnesses um, uh, adequate time to make their presentation, and we would like to start with you, Mr. Clements. There is a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it is on and be sure it is close enough to you so that uh, we can hear everything you have to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I would like to express my sympathy to the committee on the passing of Chairman Lantos, a man I understand with remarkable personal history and a man who served this country with great distinction. My condolences go out to his family and all of you. Thank you for allowing me to tell you a little bit about myself and how I have conducted my professional career over the past 25 years. I have always believed that hard work and determination were the only ways to be successful and to reach goals. Shortcuts were not an option. This was instilled in me since I was a young boy by my mother and my grandmother. Over the course of my career, I have had the opportunity to work with many trainers, chiropractors, physical therapists, and other professionals to try and educate myself and to use what knowledge they had to keep my body in the best shape it could possibly be. I met Brian McNamee while playing for the Toronto Blue Jays in 1998. I trusted him, put faith in him, brought him around my family and my children. I treated him just like I have done everyone else I have met in my life, like family. I am a positive person and I enjoy doing things for others. I am not just a ball player. I am a human being. Baseball is what I do. It is not who I am. I played the game because of my love and respect for it. I have devoted my life to it and pride myself an example for kids, my own as well as others. I have always tried to help anyone who crossed my path that was in need. To that end, here we are now with me being accused of steroids and cheating the game of baseball. If I am guilty of anything, it is of being too trusting of everyone, wanting to see the best in everyone, being too nice to everyone. If I am considered to be ignorant of that, then so be it. I have chosen to live my life with a positive attitude, yet I am accused of being a criminal and I am not supposed to be angry about that. If I keep my emotions in check, then I am accused of not caring. 
When I did speak out, I was accused of protesting too much, so I am guilty. When I kept quiet at the advice of my attorney until he could find out why in the world I was being accused of these things, I must have had something to hide, so I am guilty. People who make false accusations should not be allowed to define another person's life. I have freely without question shared my talents God gave me with children, young and old, and I will continue to do so. I have been blessed with a will and a heart that carries me on in life. I have had thousands of calls, emails from friends, working partners, teammates, fans, and men that have held the highest office in our country telling me to stand strong. These words are welcome during some very tough times for my family and me. Do I think steroids are good for helping someone's performance? No. In fact, I think they are detrimental. These types of drugs should play no role in the game of baseball and athletics at any level. Should there be more extensive testing? Yes. I think whatever is necessary for everyone involved to satisfy themselves that is not going on should be done. I have been accused of something I am not guilty of. How do you prove a negative? No matter what we discuss here today, I'm never going to have my name restored. But I've got to try and set the record straight. However, by doing so, I'm putting myself out there to all of you, knowing that because I said that I didn't take steroids, that this is looked as an attack on Senator Mitchell's report. Where am I to go with that? I'm not saying Senator Mitchell's report is entirely wrong. I am saying Brian McNamee's statements about me are wrong. Let me be clear, I have never taken steroids or HGH. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Clemens. Mr. McNamee, uh, be sure the button is pushed on the mic and that it's close enough to you so that we uh, hear every word. Thank you, Chairman Waxman, Ranking Members Davis, and other members of the committee. My name is Brian Gerard McNamee, and I was once the personal trainer for one of the greatest pitchers in the history of baseball, Roger William Clemens. During the time that I worked with Roger Clemens, I injected him on numerous occasions with steroids and human growth hormone. I also injected Andy Pettit and Chuck Knobloch with HGH. The Mitch report documented the pervasiveness of steroids and HGH in Major League Baseball, and I was unfortunately part of that problem. I want to be clear that what I did was wrong. I want to apologize to the committee and to the American people for my conduct. I have helped taint our national pastime. I hope that my testimony here today allows me, in some small way, to be part of the solution. I'm not proud of what I have done, and I am not proud to testify against the man I once admired. To those who have suggested that I take some personal satisfaction in bringing down Roger Clemens, let me assure you, nothing could be further from the truth. I take responsibility for my actions in the hopes that others may learn from my mistakes. My father, who served for 24 years with the New York City Police Department, instilled in me that people are human and make mistakes, and that I should always step up and acknowledge my mistakes despite the consequences. And so here we are. Providing information to federal investigators has been a very painful for me, and I did not seek out federal investigators. They sought me out. I did not want to cooperate because I knew that if I had told the truth, I would be providing damaging information against people who I worked for. And in the end, I cooperated with federal investigators and with Senator Mitchell. Make no mistake. When I told Senator Mitchell that I injected Andy Pettit with performance enhancing drugs, I told the truth. Andy Pettit, who I know to be honest and decent, has since confirmed this. And make no mistake, when I told Senator Mitchell that I injected Chuck Knobloch with performance enhancing drugs, I told the truth. Chuck Knobloch has also confirmed this as well. And make no mistake, when I told Senator Mitchell that I injected Roger Clemens with performance enhancing drugs, I told the truth. I told the truth about steroids and human growth hormone. I injected those drugs into the body of Roger Clemens at his direction. Unfortunately, Roger has denied this and has led a full court attack on my credibility. And let me be clear, despite Roger Clemens' statements to the contrary, I never injected Roger Clemens or anyone else with lidocaine or B12. 
I have no reason to lie and every reason not to. If I do lie, I will be prosecuted. I was never promised any special treatment or consideration for fingering star players. I was never coerced to provide information against anyone. All that I was ever told to was to tell the truth to the best of my ability. And that is what I have done. I told the investigators that I injected three people, two of whom I know confirmed my account. The third is sitting at this table. When I first provided information to federal investigators, I had not spent much time going back over these facts and trying to piece together the details. And I guess maybe I wanted to downplay the extent of their use because I felt I was betraying the players I had trained. In the following weeks and months, I've had the opportunity to think about these events and consider the specific drug regimens we used. As a result, I now believe that the numbers of times I injected Roger Clemens and Chuck Knobloch was actually greater than I initially stated. Additionally, I recently provided physical evidence to federal investigators that I believe will confirm my account, including syringes that I used in 2001 to inject Roger Clemens with performance-enhancing drugs. This evidence is 100% authentic, and the DNA and chemical analysis should bear this out. To put in context, the issue of steroids and performance enhancing drugs in baseball was starting to pick up steam in 2000. While I liked and admired Roger Clemens, I don't think that I ever really trusted him. Maybe my years as a New York City police officer had made me wary, but I just had the sense that if this ever blew up and things got messy, Roger would be looking out for number one. I viewed the syringes as evidence that would prevent me from being the only fall guy. Despite my misgivings about Roger, I have always been loyal to a fault, a trait that has gotten me into trouble in the past. Even though I saved the material, I never considered using it. When I met with federal investigators, I still did not want to destroy Roger Clemens. I was hoping this issue would just fade away. It has not faded away. And everything changed for me on January 7th when Roger Clemens' lawyer played a secretly tape recorded conversation between me and Roger in which my son's medical condition was discussed on national TV. It was despicable. The next day I retrieved the evidence and contacted my lawyers and the federal investigators. The whole experience has been a nightmare for my family. I've had to revisit and read about in the press mistakes I have made in the past and serious mistakes concerning an incident that happened in Florida in 2001 when I was a member of the Yankee organization. I lied to police officers to protect friends, ball players, coaches, and myself with whom I worked. I was wrong and I deeply regret my actions. Today, my livelihood is in ruins and it is painful beyond words to know that my name will be a forever linked to a scandal in the sport I love. Yet, the spotlight generated by Senator Mitchell's report and this hearing can help clean up the drug culture in baseball so that young people no longer see performance enhancing drugs as a necessary shortcut to success. Maybe, just maybe, all the pain and shame will have saved, served a greater good. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer all your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McNamee. Uh, under the um, previous unanimous consent agreement, we will control 15 minutes in the first round, and Mr. Davis, 15 minutes in the, uh, on his side. And I'd like to yield at this time five minutes to uh, Mr. Cummings. Oh, I'd like to yield full 15 minutes to Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for uh, being with us uh, this morning. And I was very pleased to hear both of the witnesses uh, talk about children, because that's what this was all about when we started. Uh, so many children trying to emulate their sports stars. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you a few questions, uh, Ms. Clemens. And um, I first want to make sure that you're very clear. You understand that you're under oath, is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Collins. And you know what that means, is that correct? That's correct. Very well. Um, first of all, Mr. Pettit, you, uh, Andy Pettit, is one of the most respected players in the major league. Uh, and commentator after commentator has said that he is one of the most honest people in baseball. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that, yes, sir. All right, keep your voice up. I would agree with that, yes, sir. In fact, this is what your own lawyer, Rusty Hardin, said about Mr. Pettit in the New York Times. And I quote, we have nothing to fear 
about what Andy may testify to, everyone says that Andy is honest. We have no reason to believe he will lie. Would you agree with that on that statement your lawyer made? I would agree with that, yes. Very well. Now, Mr. Clemens, I want to ask you uh, just one thing. In his deposition, Mr. Pettit told the committee that he had a conversation with you in 1999 or 2000 in which you admitted that you used human growth hormones. Is this true? It is not. So you did not tell Mr. Pettit that you used human growth hormones? I did not. And, but at the same time, you just said that he's a very honest fellow. Is that right? I believe Andy to be a very honest fellow, yes. Very well. Let's continue. In his deposition, Mr. Pettit was honest and forthcoming with the committee. He told us things that were embarrassing, that we had no way of knowing except through his own testimony. First. He confirmed that Mr. McNamee injected him with HGH in 2002, which is, the, which is in the Mitchell report. You understand that, right? I do. Then he told us that he injected himself again in 2004. We did not know about the 2004 injection, but he volunteered that information because he wanted the committee to know the entire truth. It was hard for Mr. Pettit to tell the committee about the 2004 injections. The circumstances which he described in length were exceptionally personal and embarrassing. But it was even harder for him to talk about you, Mr. Clemens. He, he's friends with both you and Mr. McNamee, and he felt caught in the middle. During his deposition, he was asked how he would resolve the conflict between two friends. Here is what he said, and I quote, I have to tell you all the truth. And one day, I have to give an account to God and not to nobody else of what I've done in my life. And that's why I've said and shared the stuff with y'all that I would not like to share with you all, end of quote. Now, Mr. Clemens, I'm reminding you that you are under oath. Mr. Clemens, do you think Mr. Pettit was lying when he told the committee that you admitted using human growth hormones? Mr. Congressman, uh, Andy Pettit is my friend. He will be my, he was my friend before this. He will be my friend after this. And again, I think Andy has misheard. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I believe Andy has misheard, Mr. Congressman, uh, on his comments about myself using HGH, which never happened. The conversation that I can recall that I had with Andy Pettit was at my house in Houston while we were working out. And I t expressed to him about a TV show, something that I've heard about three older men that were using HGH and getting back their quality of life from that. Those are the conversations that I can remember. Andy and I's friendship and closeness was such that, first of all, when I learned when he, was, uh, when he said that he used HGH, I was shocked. I had no idea. When I just heard your statement and Andy's statement about that he also injected himself, I was shocked. I had no idea that Andy Pettit had used HGH. My problem with what Andy says and why I think he misremembers is that if Andy Pettit knew that I had used HGH or I had told Andy Pettit that I had used HGH, before he would use the, pro the, sub the, the HGH, what have you, he would have come to me and asked me about it. That's how close our relationship was. And then when he did use it, I'm sure he would have told me that he used it. And I say that for the fact that we also used a product of called HydroxyCut and Thermacore. It had ephedra in it. Uh, from what I understand to be a natural tree root. I believe ephedra was banned at some uh, 2004, something of that nature. Uh, uh, 
a, a, a player in Baltimore uh, uh, passed away because of it. Andy and I talked openly about this uh, products and um, so there's no question in my mind that we would talk, if he knew that I had tried or done HGH, which I did not, he would have come to me to ask me those questions. Well, let's, let's continue. In the deposition, uh, we wanted to make absolutely sure, because we knew the, the significance of this, that Mr. Pettit had a clear recollection. And let me read another excerpt from the deposition. And this was a question to Mr. Pettit. You recollect a conversation with Mr. Clemens? Your recollection is that he said he was taking human growth hormone? Answer, yes. And you have no doubt about that recollection? I mean, no, he told me that. Now, Mr. Clemens, you know Mr. Pettit well. You just, again, described your relationship. You described him as a close friend in your deposition. Would he tell the Congress that one of his close friends was taking an illegal performance enhancing drug if there were any doubt in his mind about the truth of what he was saying? Mr. Congressman, once again, I, I, I just, believe in my, I'm sorry? No, I just want you to just go ahead and answer that. Do you, do you think he would do that? I think he misremembers uh, Very well. of, of our conversation. And let me add, in 2006, in 2006, he and I had a conversation in Atlanta's locker room when this LA Times report uh, became public about um, a Grimsley report. And um, they said that Andy's and my name were listed in that. And I remember him coming into that room, the coach's room, the, the, um, the main office there of the uh, clubhouse attendant, and sitting down in front of me wringing his hands and looking at me like he saw a ghost. And that, he looked right at me and said, what are you going to tell him? And I told him that I'm going out here and I'm going to tell him the truth. I did none of this. I never worked out with Jason Grimsley. He was a teammate of mine and I never worked out with him. And I'm going to go out here and tell him the truth. That alone should have confirmed Andy's misunderstanding that I've ever told him uh, that I used HGH. Very well. Let, let's, let's continue because I want to make sure that I get through some, some, yes, some very key points. Mr. Clemens, you have been very critical of Mr. McNamee's motives. You just did it a few minutes ago. What possible motive would Mr. Pettit have to fabricate a story about you, his friend? A Andy would have no reason to. Very well. This part was so important, we went back to Mr. Pettit a third time. A third time. We asked him to submit an affidavit to the committee. This gave him a chance to express his recollection clearly without the pressures of a deposition. I want to read to you what he wrote. It says, in 1999 or 2000, I had a conversation with Roger Clemens in which Roger told me that he had taken human growth hormones. This conversation occurred at his gym in Memorial, Texas. He did not tell me where he got the HGH or from whom, but he did tell me that it helped the body recover. It is not just Mr. Pettit who recollects this conversation. During his deposition, Mr. Pettit told us that he tells his wife everything. So we asked his wife to give us an affidavit about what she knew. And understand, this is under oath. Let me read to you what his wife said in her affidavit. I, Laura Pettit, do depose and state in 1999 or 2000, Andy told me he had had a conversation with Roger Clemens in which Roger admitted to him using human growth hormones. Mr. Clemens, once again, I remind you, you're under oath. You have said your conversation with Mr. Pettit never happened. If that was true, why would Laura Pettit remember Andy telling her about the conversation? Once again, Mr. Congress, I think he misremembers the, the conversation that we had. Uh, Andy and I's relationship was close enough to know that if I would have known that he was, had done HGH, which I now know, that he would, if he was knowingly knowing that I had 
uh, taken HGH, we would have talked about the subject. He would have come to me to ask me about the effects of it. Well, the fact is, Mr. Mr. Clemens, that apparently now you know he knew it and he didn't tell you. Has your, has your mind changed about his credibility? Uh, Andy's a, a fine gentleman. I, I have no reason, again, uh, Very well. I think he misremembers. Very well. Let me I, go I know, on. I, I, again, our relationship was close enough uh, that if I knew that, if he knew that I had tried HGH, which I hadn't, and he would have come to me and talked to me and I discussed the subject. I understand. The 19, in 1999 or 2000 conversations is not the only conversation that Mr. Pettit remembers having with you about HGH. He also remembers a second conversation very clearly. This conversation took place in 2005. Let me read to you what he wrote about this conversation in his affidavit. In 2000, and I quote, in 2005, around the time of the congressional hearings into the use of performance enhancing drugs in baseball, I had a conversation with Roger Clemens in Kissimmee, Florida. I asked him what he would say if asked by reporters if, ever, if, if he had ever used performance enhancing drugs. When he asked what I meant, I reminded him that he had told me that he had used HGH. Roger responded by telling me that I must have misunderstood him. He claimed that it was his wife, Debbie, who used HGH. And I said, OK, or words to that effect, not because I agreed with him, but because I wasn't going to argue with him. This conversation happened just three years ago. And it is a kind of conversation that most people would remember. It is hard for me to imagine that Mr. Pettit made up this conversation. Did you have a conversation with him to this effect? I don't believe I had a conversation in 2005 with him in Kissimmee, Florida. We'd have been with the Houston Astros at the time. Um, but I, I don't remember that conversation whatsoever. Are you saying that you don't remember it? Or are you telling us that you didn't have it? Do you, do you know? And the reason why I'm asking you that is because we're dealing with some serious matters here. And I right. want to give you, you wanted a fair chance to, to address this committee. And I'm just wondering, do you, are you telling us under oath that it didn't happen? Or you're saying you just don't remember? I, I don't re remember that. And again, I'll address the, uh, any conversation about my wife, Debbie, using HGH. Um, I know that at one point she read a USA Today article about that. I don't know the year. It sure could have been 2005 when this article came about, and they just, you know, the, it was just general talk All right. um, about HGH. Let me go on. Laura Pettit also has a clear recollection of being told about this conversation by her husband. Let me read what she uh, wrote. A few years later, I believe in 2005, Andy again told me of a conversation with Roger Clemens about HGH. Andy told me that he had been thinking that, that if a reporter asked him, he would tell the reporter of his own use of HGH in 2002. He said that he told Roger Clemens this and asked Roger what he would say if asked. And he told me that in, 2000, in the 2005 conversation, Roger denied using HGH and told Andy that Andy was mistaken about their earlier conversation. According to Andy, Roger said that it was his wife, Debbie, who used HGH. Now, the timeline is very important here. According to Mr. Pettit's, Pettit, his first conversation with you, Mr. Clemens, occurred in 1999 or 2000. But you told us that your wife did not use HGH until 2003. That makes it impossible that you could have been referring to your wife's use of HGH in the first conversation. These aren't the only relevant conversations that Mr. Pettit told us about. He told us that after his first conversation with you, Mr. Clemens, he spoke with Mr. McNamee. Let me read what you, what, 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 let me read to you again that affidavit. And I quote, shortly after my conversation with, with Roger, I spoke with Brian McNamee. Only he and I were parties to the conversation. I asked Roger about HGH and told him that Roger said he had used it. <coughs> Brian McNamee became angry. He told me that Roger should not have told me about his use of HGH because it was supposed to be confidential. Mr. McNamee, do you remember that conversation? Yes, sir. Did it happen? Yes, sir. Mr. Cummings, uh, your time has expired. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Davis for 15 minutes. Um, thank you very much. I, good news is everybody, I think, understands the dangers of steroids and HGH, and I think we're, it's the one thing you, both of you agree on. Um, Mr. McAmey, let me start with you, uh, just because they asked all their questions, Mr. Clemens. I have questions for both of you. Um, you mentioned in your earlier statement how the number of times that the players, you injected the players, has constantly risen every time you've testified somewhere. You, you've you've um, alleged that Mr. Clemens' steroid used to at least uh, five groups of people, your lawyers, federal agents, Senator Mitchell and his staff, private investigators for Mr. Clemens, and then our staff during uh, depositions. Um, why has the number continued to change if we're coming clean each time? Thank you for the question. Um, the, the, the beginning of the investigation with the federal government, as I uh, didn't know what questions they were going to ask me about specific players and injections, I had no recollection of the amounts of times, because it wasn't part of my regimen where I would mark it down. It was um, pretty much, you know, done by the players. They would tell me when and I would do it. But it came because I downplayed it to the beginning where I didn't want to hurt the players, even though I told the truth about their injections and their use. And then as I lived this for the last two months, and then I had realized, as I said in my opening statement, about the regimens. There were specific different types of regimens for testosterone, winstrol, and growth hormone that I started to think more about it. Um, even though I can't be accurate, you know, these are, these are just ballpark numbers or best guesstimate as far as lower end, high end, as I thought about the regimen over time. I mean, the ballpark for Knobloch went from seven to nine times to 50 times. Uh, yes, you have to understand, every time I, re I met, sir, with investigators, Senator Mitchell, with the congressional panel, I had more time to think about it. And the regimen for growth hormone was four times a week. So then I just did the math. You didn't, okay. So you didn't keep any records or anything? This is just going back? Uh, so every time I met, record. each individual time, did it go up? Anything change? Everything go up? And I was specifically living this every single day, as opposed to I didn't think about it for years. Did you reinform the federal government about these changes as you went forward to the federal yeah. prosecutors? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Mr. Clemens, shortly after your call, and I'm going to ask some questions about the January 4th call between you and Mr. McNamee. Uh, shortly after your call with Brian McNamee on Friday, January 4th, you sent him an email. In the email, you very clearly tell Mr. McNamee there is nothing to talk about unless he admits he is lying. Did you ever get a response to this email? I'm sorry? To the email, did you ever get a response to your email to Mr. McNamee uh, on Friday, January 4th, where you, uh, this was after your phone call? Um, Congressman, after the phone call um, that was taped, uh, I believe I sent an email back to him saying that unless you're going to come forward and tell the truth, right. I, we have nothing to say. Did discuss. he ever respond? Uh, he did not. That's what, that's what I'm asking. I don't believe you. Um, in the phone, during the phone call, Mr. McNamee, during that call that you had with Mr. Clemens, um, Mr. Clemens said, I just need you to come out and tell the truth. And you didn't respond. Why didn't you just tell Mr. Clemens during the course of that conversation, Roger, I did tell the truth. I had to tell the truth. This was, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. That's all you needed to say in this conversation. This was a conversation between the two of you. Just, it seems to me this would have been a time where if this was a friend and you felt pained about having to expose him, you would have said, Roger, I had to tell the truth. Why, did. you, why, why in that conversation didn't you say that? Because at the state of that conversation, I realized that it was being taped, and I also didn't know if anyone else was listening. So I also was trying not to hurt him if it wasn't just him taping me. But if you listen to it and you know my jargon, I did say that. It is what it is. And how in your jargon did you say that? I said it is what it is, meaning that it, I did tell the truth. Um, and you knew it was, I mean, for posterity and everything else, I would have thought this would have been a good opportunity for you to step forward. But you were afraid of hurting others at this point. I was afraid of hurting Roger Clemens. Um, in your testimony, um, uh, Mr. McMahon, in your testimony about 2001, you added an additional substance, parabolin, uh, on the list of steroids you injected into Mr. Clemens. 
you didn't tell Senator Mitchell about that. Is that again because you weren't focused on that at the time and you hadn't had time to think about it? Uh, that's accurate, sir. I just, it, it wasn't until, um, I don't remember actually that question being asked if there was any, there any other steroids being injected um, by anybody else except for the congressional panel. And they, I thought about it, I thought about it, and it just, like, like increasing the numbers of injections, it just it came to me that parabolin was also another steroid used by Mr. Clements. You testified uh, in your deposition um, that Mr. Clements on one occasion bled through his designer pants uh, and uh, a player noticed it and that's when he b you bought Band-Aids. There weren't a lot of uh, blood, uh, there wasn't a lot of blood a lot of times, but since he was wearing his dress pants, he bled through and Mike Stanton had noticed it and made a comment. So he then, he always traveled now with those little Band-Aids for his butt if he bled, and that's your quote. Uh, he said something to Roger about growth hormone. I think it was Stanton started taking uh, growth hormone and he said something knowing that. And I walked right into Roger, just turned around to Stanton and said, hey man, whatever I can do to get the edge. And Stanton was asking him, thinking I told him he was taking steroids or growth hormone, et cetera. Do you recall any, and let me ask this, uh, Mr. Clemens, do you recall any bleeding through your pants in 2001? I, I don't. You recall Mike Stanton never talking to you about growth hormone? And I, and I don't, and I had no knowledge that Mike uh, Stanton was using growth hormone. You recall him asking you about blood on your pants? No. Do you ever say, you recall saying anything to Mr. Stanton about getting an edge, even as a joke? Could, could that have occurred? When I'm, uh, Congressman, when I'm on the mound, I want an edge. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, so. Uh, Let me ask you, Mr. McAmey, could you describe that a little clearer, uh, what happened at that point? Involving Mr. Stanton? It, well, yeah, the, the incident involving him and bleeding through the pants and how uh, often this my, happened. Was my best, sir, excuse me, my best recollection was that I didn't witness Mr. Stanton witness him bleeding through his pants. It was just a comment that Mr. Clements had told me. That's why he started buying Band-Aids, uh, those little Band-Aids to cover up any blood that might bleed. And on a separate occasion, if not the same occasion on the plane, I had walked into Mr. Stanton talking to Roger about growth hormone and I was upset that I, I believe that Mike Stanton duped Roger into thinking I had told Stanton about his growth hormone use and Roger's response was I'll do anything to take an edge and I didn't respond to it and I was upset so you that didn't, you, you didn't witness any of this? this was I witnessed, I witnessed the, the conversation as Roger had turned around and said I'll do, I'll do whatever it does to, take it, to get an edge and then I figured out because I also trained Mike Stanton on a, on a, on a somewhat one-on-one -on -one basis that the conversation that he duped him into telling him because I wouldn't tell Stanton. Okay. Well, did Stanton use steroids? I know he used growth hormone, yes. Okay. Did you tell the Mitchell report that? I believe so, yes. Okay. The Mitchell report talks about the party at Jose Canseco's house uh, on or about uh, June 8th through 10th, 1998. Uh, this was toward the end of the road trip. It included a Marlin series after the Blue Jays returned home to Toronto. Uh, 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 this is allegedly uh, Mr. Clemens then approached you and for the first time brought up the subject of steroid. I think that was your testimony. I want to ask some questions about that because the Conseco barbecue is a key event in 1998 where your testimonies differ significantly. You describe the barbecue as potentially the time and place where Roger Clemens comes into possession of anabolic steroids. You told us in your deposition you have a vivid recollection of Clemens being at the barbecue. Do you stand by that? Yes, sir. Now, all the evidence that the committee's obtained goes the other way. For example, Jose Canseco completed an affidavit and was interviewed by the staff. He said he remembers the barbecue as if it were yesterday. He, Canseco says Clemens was not there. He remembers being disappointed that Mr. Clemens wasn't there. He specifically remembers having his high school baseball coach at the barbecue and being disappointed that he was unable to introduce the coach to Clemens. Conseco's affidavit reads, on Tuesday, June 9, 1998, I hosted a barbecue at my house for my teammates and other Blue Jays staff members. It was an honor for me to host a luncheon for my new team. During that luncheon, there were approximately 30 to 40 people present. I specifically recall that Clemens did not come to the barbecue. I remember this because I was disappointed that he did not attend. According to news reports, Blue Jays 
uh, catcher at the time, Darren Fletcher doesn't remember seeing Clemens there. The Blue Jays trainer at the time, Tommy Craig and Scott Shannon told us they don't remember Clemens being at the barbecue. The Blue Jays traveling secretary at the time specifically remembers Clemens not being on the team bus that traveled to the barbecue and does not remember Clemens being there. Mr. Conseco's wife at the time, the then Jessica Conseco, now Jessica Fisher, has supplied an affidavit to the committee that she does not remember Clemens being there. And audio from the television broadcast of two different games during the three game series has the announcers talking about the barbecue and how Roger Clemens did not attend. And Mr. Clemens has produced a golf receipt showing that he played golf that day. Now how do you explain you're the only person that remembers him that day and is that a critical juncture? I don't think it's that critical um, in regards to Mr. Clemens' steroid use. But I guess as far as asking me is it critical in my recollection, I, I have two distinct um, memories of that party. And one of them is as I was eating a sandwich next to Mr. Uh, Canseco's pool by myself, I noticed a young child running towards the pool. And as I looked up, there was a woman chasing after the young child and she was wearing a peach bikini with green in it with board shorts. She was a thin, probably mid to late thirties woman and uh, she grabbed the kid, the child, who was about two years old at the time, if not younger. And I later found out from one of the ballplayers, I said, who's that? And they said, it's Roger's nanny. And then I had turned around to see Roger and Debbie Clemens talking in the middle and then they went inside the house. I, I did believe I said hello to Roger and I know Roger showed up a little bit later. And I also have... Um, How do you know he showed up later? Because you saw him later? I, I saw him there at the house of Jose Canseco's. And I believe um, we've had numerous conversations about how great that party would have been if it, if it wasn't for the fact that we had a game that night. And all we had was sandwiches and iced tea because Jose had a really nice house. Mr. Clemens, your golf receipt that day is time stamped 8.58. Uh, do you recall what time you teed off? Well, the time I would get out of the pro shop and, and uh, get ready to tee off, it had been a good 30, 40 minutes probably. Um, the, the, the time was 8 uh, again, I'm sorry? 8.58, so it would have been after 9 that you would have teed off. Yeah. How long does it generally take you to play around? Maybe four. Every bit of four hours, four and a half, depending on How the traffic. How far was the golf course uh, from Mr. Conseco's house? Any idea? I, I don't. I wouldn't think it was um, 20 minutes at, at best. D um, did you eat lunch after your round of golf that day? Do you remember? I don't remember. You pitched seven innings the night before. What would have been your pattern in practice on the day after pitching? What time did you ordinarily show up to the ballpark the day after you started? Uh, the day after is... Um, uh, well, obviously the day after I enjoy playing golf. I usually enjoy playing golf the day before I pitch and the day after when I can. Um, uh, I like the, uh, you know, obviously getting outdoors anytime I can, uh, especially when we're on the road. I do not like uh, hanging in the hotel room. Uh, the, night, the night before the barbecue, the Blue Jays lost 4-3 to three in 17 innings. Does that ring a, a bell? Does that It does. Uh, and, uh, you said earlier I threw that game, so obviously there was a no decision uh, involved, I would imagine. Were your wife and children in Miami for this series? Yes. Okay. You think you might have gone on, uh, the, the, on to the barbecue after golf? Um, I, I don't remember a, uh, his, his party. Um, okay. Is it possible your wife and some of your kids could have gone without you? I believe my wife, Debbie, was in my golf foursome, and um, the kids sure could have been. Okay. I, I don't remember that they were... But you don't remember being there at all? I right? don't. Okay. The okay. reason I ask that is because it was, uh, this was uh, brought up and this was the beginning, I think, of, uh, as I look at the testimony, the, of your starting to ask about these questions right at that time or right uh, thereafter. Um, we've also spoken to a number of medical professionals inside and outside of baseball. This is about the vitamin, vitamin B12 shots, and I know a lot of players seem to take it. We had a hearing on this uh, yesterday. Um, they, most of them say B12 is not beneficial unless you have a dire medical need for it, like if you had anemia. What's your experience been through injecting B12? I was encouraged to take B12 
All the way back since 1988, my mother uh, encouraged me to take B12. Um, uh, I, I think it's beneficial. I, I take vitamins uh, every other day. Uh, I take uh, B12 in the tablet form. I take vitamin E. I take a multivitamin. Uh, again, just about uh, every other day. And um, I think it was most common if anybody was sick on the team or if your energy felt run down and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't know the technical benefits for it, but uh, I've always um, assumed that it was, it was, um, it was a good, good thing did to did have. Did you inject yourself with B12, or did Mr. McNamee ever inject you, or do you remember? I've never injected myself. Uh, Mr. McNamee's given me three shots of, uh, when we were in Toronto, three shots of B12, uh, two in New York. Okay. Mr. McNamee, is that, do you concur with that? The first time I heard of Roger taking B12 was on 60 Minutes. I've never given Roger Clemens B12 and never heard of B12 really before. Is my time up. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Tierney for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my questions, I guess, are going to be a little bit about who's telling the truth here as well. I have questions for both Mr. McNamee and Mr. Clemens about whether or not they've been telling the truth to us or to investigators. Okay. Mr. McNamee, let me start with you, if we could. We know that in some previous investigations you haven't uh, always been honest. You were involved in a criminal investigation in Florida in 2001. You told committee investigators that you provided the police in that investigation with statements that were not truthful. Mr. McNamee, were you truthful to government investigators in Florida in 2001? No, sir. You also told the committee that you withheld information from federal prosecutors who were investigating the steroid use by professional baseball players. You didn't give prosecutors the whole truth about the number of injections that you gave Mr. Knobloch and Mr. Clemens, and you now say that there were more injections than you previously admitted to. And you withheld physical evidence, syringes, needles, and gauze pads that you claim you used to inject Mr. Clemens in 2001. Mr. McNamee, were you truthful uh, to federal investigators last year? No, sir. Why did you mislead the investigators? The part about the injections Sorry. were um, part recollection and part withholding, trying not to hurt these players, um, and about the evidence. Once again, I, I really felt bad for the situation that I was in. I felt bad for the, having to be confronted to, um, with the federal investigators and Senator Mitchell, but everything I told them about their use was true. Well, I, I think it's important we establish that on the record. I, you've admitted credibility problems in the past, and I think that we have to keep that in mind as we, as we move forward. But Mr. Clemens, let me turn to you, yes, if sir. I might. I know you've been visiting members of Congress recently, and, and members seem to have been impressed by your apparent credibility in person. But we know that some of the things you told us with great earnestness appear to, to not be accurate. And this raises the questions about your own credibility. Let me read to you from page 66 of your deposition. Okay. You were asked, did you ever speak with Mr. McNamee about human growth hormone? And you answered, I have not. Then you were asked, never asked him any questions about it? And you answered, never asked him. You were then asked the question a third time. The question was, do you recall a specific instance where you did speak with Mr. McNamee about HGH? And your answer was, I don't remember. The only thing I remember about the topic was, there was an article, a show about some elderly men that had a curve in his spine, and then later on in the show he was able to play golf, and that's basically the conversation we had. When you gave those answers in your deposition, you seemed earnest, you seemed credible, according to those that were questioning you, much like you do today. Were your answers truthful? Yes, they were. Okay. With uh, respect to you, we know that you didn't give the committee the truthful answers much later in your deposition then because you were asked whether any members of your family had taken HGH. In answering that question later in your deposition, you told the committee staff about two specific conversations that you had with Mr. McNamee about HGH. So I want to walk you through that testimony about the time your wife was injected with HGH by Mr. McNamee. At the outset, there doesn't appear to be any dispute between you and Mr. McNamee about whether your wife, Debbie Clemens, was injected with HGH by Mr. McNamee in 2003. You both told the committee about this in your depositions, but you gave very different accounts of what actually happened. Mr. Clemens, according to your account, Mr. McNamee injected your wife in your bedroom without your knowledge. Here's what you said on page 174 of your deposition. I was not present at the time. 
I found out later in the evening, and the reason I found out, she was telling me that something was going on with the circulation, and this concerned me. You also said on page 176 of the deposition, the next day she still was not feeling comfortable, something about her circulation. You told us you had a very strong reaction. You told us you were so concerned about what happened that you searched some luggage of Mr. McNamee that he had stored in your house looking for other evidence of drugs. Do I have that right so far? That is correct, sir, yes. You then told us about two specific conversations you had with Mr. McNamee about your wife and HGH. The first happened that night when you called him on the telephone. So let me read that part of the transcript to you. That's on page 174. Oh, no. You said, we had a pretty heated discussion about it, that I don't know enough about it, and that we don't know enough about it. You then told the committee, I also called him the next day because she still was not feeling comfortable, something about her circulation. I wasn't happy about it. I said, we don't know anything about this. He says it's legal. There's no law against it. Now, Mr. Clemens, you told the committee that you had had no conversations with Mr. McNamee about HGH. You did that three times in the early part of your deposition. But your own statements now show that you had two specific and memorable conversations with him about HGH. So when you were asked on three specific occasions, why didn't you tell the committee about those conversations when you were asked, did you ever speak with Mr. McNamee about human growth hormone? Uh, prior to uh, he, he injecting my wife, Mr. Congressman, we had no conversation about HGH in any substance uh, or any detail whatsoever. Um, and definitely, uh, again, I'm going to read a statement from my wife here in just a minute, but we never discussed HGH in detail. Uh, I go back to, again, Andy Pettit. If I was a part of using HGH or a user, a user of HGH, Brian McNamee would have come told me that Andy was a part of this. Um, I, I would have, I'm certain, again, I would have known about uh, all this. Well, help us if out, I, Mr. Clemens, if I might. You, later in your depositions, when you talked about your wife, the early part of your deposition, three times, in very clear and unambiguous questions and answers, did you ever speak with Mr. McNamee about human growth hormone? I have not. The question, did you ever? Second time, you said you never asked him about any questions. You answered, never asked him. The third time, said, do you recall a specific instance where you did speak with Mr. McNamee about HGH? said, I don't remember. Then later on, you go to recall two very specific conversations. How do you reconcile three times saying you didn't, and then later when somebody specifically finally asks you about your wife, you have a recollection of two very distinct and memorable conversations. Mr. Congressman, again, uh, I never had any detailed discussions with Brian McNamee about HGH. Um, well, didn't you call him on the phone after your wife had told you that she had taken HGH? That very much is detailed conversation. It certainly is. And it, it sure is. And, it, and if I may. Well, just, I, I just want to know if you can reconcile that. How do you say three times that you never did speak to him about it and then later on acknowledge that, in fact, you had? A pretty heated conversation, you said. Very heated conversation about it. And again, prior to that, we had not had discussions about HGH. But Mr. Clemens, the, the questions early morning hadn't been prior to your wife's. The questions were, had you ever? And you can see where that leads us to some credibility issues here. You three times said never, and then only when somebody really presses you on a specific incident, you have a recollection of two memorable conversations. And, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, uh, prior to Mr. Congressman, we had no detailed uh, discussion about HGH. Um, prior to what? Dur pr during my uh, testimony with the committee, and I believe the committee ran down uh, when they were asking me the question about front office people, uh, other employees, and that's when they said family on, on, the, uh, on the question. That, that's all helpful, Ms. Clinton. These I was, questions I'm reading to you right from the transcript, what you're referring to now happened later. That's right? correct. The three distinct questions were specifically about whether you ever spoke with Mr. McNamee, and three times you said never. Right? Later, somebody brought up the fact about your wife, and that's the inconsistency that we have. Let me, let me go on a little bit. It's not the only area where we have some question, because I'll read to you another excerpt from your deposition. Okay. You were asked, it's on page 67 if you want, I Did you do any research on your own about human growth hormone? And you answered, no, I haven't. I've never researched it. I couldn't tell you the first thing about it. Seems a little difficult to believe. You testified that your wife was injected by Mr. McNamee without your knowledge of HGH. 
She didn't feel well and started to have circulation problems. You felt so strongly about what Mr. McNamee had done that you searched his luggage to make sure there were no drugs in the house. What did your doctor say about this? Uh, I talked to Deborah about calling our doctor and she said that she was just feeling very uncomfortable and in her words, wigged out about it. Um, and not only did the reason I searched his luggage uh, for the fact that uh, he would always leave luggage behind and have us mail out his luggage and leave without his luggage at my house, uh, no differently than when I uh, spoke to him about bringing alcohol onto my property. I had young kids. Um, that is the uh, conversation that it was about. I, I was comfortable with my wife's reaction. She told you she had circulation problems. She felt that she was having circulation problems, yes. But you never called a doctor. Certainly it seems, most reasonable people I think, that if that were the case, your wife told you that she was having a reaction, circulation problems, and particularly if it was administered by a fitness trainer without your knowledge, that you would have called a doctor to find out what the consequences were. You never did that. Without, we did not, and I did talk to Deb about that, if we should call our, our uh, doctor. What steps did you take to learn about the effects of HGH after you learned that your wife had taken the injection? I didn't take a lot of steps, Mr. Congressman. I've to be um, uh, uh, in the last two last two months since this has been going on. I've learned more about HGH than I than I ever thought. I still don't know enough about it. I don't know. Uh, you know, I've heard that. Uh, you know, I've seen things on TV that it, these guys talk about how it helps them, actors and different things of that nature. I I don't know anything about it. Well, I guess, gentlemen, that's where the question comes in. If I might, just Mr. Chairman. You, Ms. Collins, you want us to believe that Mr. McNamee injected your wife without your knowledge, that she started suffering serious side effects of the drug, that you were upset enough to call Mr. McNamee and then search his leg luggage, but despite all that, you never made inquiry of a doctor and you never even looked up to see what the effects might be. Is that Mr. right? Mr. Congressman, I, I, I don't believe I ever said serious, serious effects. She said she was having itching and she had some type of circulation problem that, that she was feeling. Gentlemen's no, time has expired. Uh, chair yields to uh, Mr. Davis 10 minutes to control. Go, Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the tapes of the Toronto Blue Jays uh, Florida Marlin game uh, has several comments on it about uh, Mr. Clemens not being at that Conseco party. And uh, Mr. Conseco provided a sworn affidavit stating that Clements did not attend that party, and you indicated that he came to the party late. Uh, how do you square that with what was on television, on the radio, and, and what uh, the sworn uh, affidavit of Conseco's was? I, I mean, there's some inconsistency there. It's, my recollection is not inconsistent. What they said, they said, I, I, I recall Roger Clements being at that party. <laughs> Why did you keep those gauze pads? I'm sorry? Why did you keep the needles in the gauze pads? Um, like I had mentioned in my opening statement. Um, well, I, I want to read to you what you said in the sworn testimony, okay? And this was 2000, 2001 that these uh, pads were uh, accumulated, right? 2001, 2002, sir. Okay, 2001, 2002. And you worked for Clements up until what, 2006? 2007. 2007, so you stayed with him five years after you kept these materials, right? Yes, sir. Okay, I want to read this to you. It says, I kept them well because throughout my time with Roger Clemens, it, it was there always somewhat in the back of my mind that I distrusted him to a degree. And my gut feeling and the fact that I was an ex-cop, I just felt it. And I think there were bits and pieces coming out in the paper. Why in the world would you work for somebody that you thought was... Uh, uh, unethical and would lie, and why would you keep this information for five years uh, if, you, if, if he was your friend and you thought that, that, that uh, he was to be distrusted? He was my employer. You, you do this to all your employers? I mean, is this the kind of uh, employee you was, to keep gauze pads and needles and everything for five years and go on and keep working for them? Well, it wasn't something that, that I thought about. It was just there, and it kept coming up. Um, it was in, in the basement. And as I, as I thought about it, more things came up. And as you saw um, in 2000, I wrote uh, an article in the New York Times regarding the more stuff that kept coming out about steroid use in baseball. So for the fact that I, I never felt good about what I was doing, the fact that it was illegal, I figured because I've done things before for other people and have got hurt by it, I might as well hold on to these things. And it wasn't something I dwelled on. 
How many, how many other uh, people did you uh, uh, treat that you kept their uh, gauze pads and needles? Possibly one other. And who was that? Chuck Knobloch. Do you still have them? I believe it's in the possession of the federal government. Yeah. Why, why did you not give those to the uh, uh, Mitchell Report Committee immediately uh, when you were contacted by them? Because I felt horrible about being in the position that I was in. You, now, let me get, I want to make sure I got this straight. Uh, your friend, Roger Clemens, you allegedly gave him these shots. You kept the pads and the needles for five years and went on and kept working for him uh, because he was your employer. And, and, and then you said you, what, you felt bad. You felt bad about pr uh, proposing and giving these to the Mitchell Committee when you first started talking to them? Yes, sir. Gee whiz, are you kidding me? No, sir. My goodness. Yeah, and, and as I understand it from my colleague here, you told the New York Times that you had no direct proof at, uh, at the beginning of this investigation, right? I'm, s I'm sorry? You told the New York Times that you had no direct evidence like the gauze and needles at the beginning of all this. I told the, the I didn't talk to the New York Times. I told the federal investigators and the Mitchell people that I had no direct evidence so as far as physical January evidence. January 5th, 2008. What's that? So you miss, you, so you didn't, you, you didn't tell the truth then initially to them? No, sir. You lied? Yes, sir. We, there's several things here that, that really bother me. First of all, you lied about him being at Conseco. Conseco said he wasn't there in a sworn affidavit. On the radio and on the television, they said he wasn't there. And yet you still maintain that he did come there. And now you, you, you admit you lied about this. Are you lying about anything else? I mean, why don't you tell us? No, sir, and I'm not lying about Jose Conseco's house. So you just, uh, you just lie when it's convenient for you? No, sir. What's that? Yeah, can you pull the microphone a little bit closer, please? Mr. Clemens, in your defamation lawsuit against McNamee, uh, it says that according to McNamee, he originally made his allegations to federal authorities after being threatened with criminal prosecution if he did not implicate you. That's an allegation of coercion. Uh, why do you consider McNamee trustworthy on this point? And, and how do you have this kind of information that he might have been coerced into his testimony? Um, I just, uh, we, uh, the, what I've heard on different occasions um, mm -hmm. about what he said and, and what he hasn't said, uh, uh, the, there was a, a tape that I heard, the timeline would have been four or five days before the uh, report came out, it was a taped conversation from Jim Murray. And that's basically where I heard the allegations that were being said by Brian McNamee about uh, myself and uh, Andy Pettit also, which again, that's the first time that uh, I heard Andy Pettit's name and I, about using HGH, I said absolutely no way. Of course, now that I've learned that Andy has done it, I uh, was shocked. Mr. McNamee, I'm going to read to you a series of prior statements attributed to you regarding steroid use or the lack thereof by Mr. Clemens or Mr. Pettit. I never gave Clemens or Pettit steroids. They never asked me for steroids. The only thing they asked me for were vitamins. William, that was William Sherman and T.J. Quinn, Andy Totes, Baggage to Bronx, New York Daily News, December 10, 2006. Did you say that? Yes, I did. Is that a lie? Yes, it is. Oh, it's another one. Okay. I told federal investigators twice that uh, Roger and Andy had nothing to do with it. Is that right? Yes, sir. Is that a lie? Yes, sir. Okay. I said, Roger and Andy, you know what? You have to talk to them. I don't know anything about that. I don't, anything, I don't know anything about that. Transcript of interview by Jim Yarbrough and Billy Beck. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that, please? I said, Roger and Andy, you know what? You have to talk to them. I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about that. That's a transcript of the interview by Jim Yarbrough and Billy Beck, Belk and Brian McNamee, December 12, 2007. Is that correct? I'm not sure. What, what are you referring to? What am, I, what am I saying I don't know anything about? Sir? Let me, let me read you. Well, let's pass on that because uh, I'm sorry. 
Oh, these are, this is a quote you told the investigators. We'll pass mm -hmm. on that. Mr. McNamee, I'm going to read you a series of statements attributed to you regarding your involvement with steroids. I don't have any dealings with steroids or amphetamines. I don't buy it, sell it, condone it, or recommend it. I don't make money from it. It's not part of my livelihood and not part of my business. Did you say that? Yep. That's a lie, right? Partial. Partial? Partial lie. <laughs> McNamee pleads guilty to knowing the ins and outs of steroids, but says, I have no involvement as far as supplying it, getting it, selling it, telling them to use it. John Heyman, the sixth man, Clemens trainer, denies link to Grimsley Lug. Is that a lie? Yes, sir. Okay. You know, I'm not going to read any more of this. Uh, this, this, is, this is really disgusting. You're here as a sworn uh, uh, witness. You're here to tell the truth. You're here under oath. And yet we have lie after lie after lie after lie where you, 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 you've, you've told this committee and the people of this country uh, that uh, Roger Clemens did things that I don't know what to believe. I know one thing I don't believe, and that's you. The, the other thing I want to say is that, uh, and I want to say this about this whole investigation. You know, uh, uh, Donovan, who was the Secretary of Labor, uh, was accused of wrongdoing and went to trial. And he was uh, uh, found innocent within about 20 minutes. And he came out and said, how do I get my reputation back? You know, Roger Clemens, unless it's proven that he used steroids, and so far I haven't seen anything like If he did, he ought to be held accountable. But Roger Clemens is a baseball, uh, 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 he's a titan in baseball. And you, and with all these lies, if they're not true, are destroying him and his reputation. Now, how does he get his reputation back if this is not true? And how can we believe you because you've lied and lied and lied and lied? And the thing I want to say is that we have this pension in the country of trial by media. I mean, I understand the media has a right to come to these things and to get all the information that they can. But uh, until, in this country, until a man is proven guilty, he's innocent. And this kind of a hearing and this kind of a, a circus that I call it really bothers me. If he's done something wrong, he ought to be indicted, he ought to be prosecuted, and he ought to be punished for it. But I don't see any evidence of that so far. And uh, with that, I'll stop. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Massachusetts for 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member. Uh, since the, the testimony uh, is uh, so contradictory in this case, I'd like to at least refer to some of the physical evidence that we have before the committee. Uh, Mr. Clemens, early in the investigation, you provided the committee with a transcript uh, of a secretly taped interview by, uh, conducted by two of your investigators. Uh, the interview was of Brian, with Brian McNamee, and it took place at Mr. McNamee's home on December 12, 2007. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, during the interview, Mr. McNamee, you told investigators that, uh, that you had injected uh, Mr. Clemens with Wist Winstrol, a, a steroid, in 1998, and uh, your exact testimony is that, uh, well, actually, that he probably developed an abscess uh, on his uh, buttocks as a result of the injection, and you said, uh, quote, it was probably my fault because Winstrol, I learned later that you're not supposed to inject it quickly. You're supposed to do it very slowly. That way it dispenses slowly. If you do it quickly, then it settles in a pool of fat, and that is how an abscess is formed, and that's what happened. So it was probably my fault. Now, being under oath today, is that basically correct as far as your testimony goes regarding uh, that incident? Yes, sir. Okay. In pursuit of, of uh, further information on this, we, we in the committee asked for medical records during this time period. And a medical record from July 28, 1998 uh, was, was provided uh, by the Toronto Blue Jays at the time that said that there was a, a palpable mass, quote unquote, uh, on, on the right buttock of, of Mr. Clemens. On another record, it also noticed a similar mass on, on the left buttock. 
And the July 28th record said uh, also that Roger received a B12 injection approximately 7 to 10 days ago into his right buttock from Dr. Taylor at the Sky Dome. So we brought in Dr. Taylor and asked him some questions about this. He said that he did give a B12 shot to Mr. Clemens, but he could not remember exactly when. We also asked Mr. Clemens about it, and in his previous testimony he said, it says right here Dr. Taylor had given me a B12 shot, so that surely could have happened. Uh, Mr. Clemens, you also told us that the palpable mass could have had other causes. For example, you said that the muscle strain, that a muscle strain, which you called a strained glute, could have led to the problem. Uh, the medical records indicated that after the July 28 diagnosis, uh, Mr. Clemens was sent to have an MRI, and this MRI was not provided in the original set of documents that the committee received. And uh, in fact, it was not easy for the committee to receive, to obtain the MRI uh, from counsel for Mr. Clemens, and uh, repeated requests were made for this MRI, and we only received the MRI, MRI report on Monday, after the committee informed counsel for Mr. Clemens that the committee would consider stronger options if the document were not provided to the committee voluntarily. The MRI report provides important additional information about the injury to Mr. Clement and the palpable mass on his buttocks. According to the report, and I quote, the injury was, quote, likely related to the patient's prior attempted intramuscular injections. I want to repeat that. It says it was likely related to the patient's prior attempted intramuscular injections. And to get more insight into the significance of this MRI, we actually stripped the name. We redacted the report uh, from the records and provided them to the chief of muscular, excuse me, musculoskeletal radiology at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, Dr. Mark Murphy. He is one of the le country's leading experts on MRI. And we asked him to review the records and give us his opinion. He issued a report, which I'd like to make part of the hearing record. The MRI report... Without objection, that'll be the way. The MRI report we received says that the injury, and this is a quote from, from Dr. Murphy, it says it was likely related to the patient's prior attempted intramuscular injections. And Mr. Excuse me, that Mr. Murphy agreed with that, uh, Dr. Murphy agreed with that diagnosis. He said that the MRI showed that the muscles of the buttocks showed no strain or trauma, so he concluded that the injury was not a strained muscle. Next, he gave his opinion about whether the injury was more likely caused by B12, as, as you've asserted, or steroids, as Mr. McNamee claims. And to be fair, Dr. Murphy stated that he could not be definitive without seeing the films, and he cautioned that the patient's reaction can vary. He said it wasn't a true abscess, but he did say this, and this is a quote. It is my opinion that the history and the MR imaging descriptions are more compatible with the Rinstral injection as the inflammatory component is prominent by report. Mr. Chairman, I know it's highly irregular. May I ask counsel to Roger Clemens please address the point of the congressman for one moment, please? The rules of the committee provide that counsel may advise their clients but not speak directly to the uh, hearing itself. Well, Mr. Chairman, given Reclaiming this, my time, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I would request that I be permitted, given I, the I'm fact sorry the rules don't provide it. Please talk to your client and have him answer any questions that are outstanding. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Reclaiming my time, if I may. Uh, during our investigation, we also asked Dr. Taylor about whether he thought the B12 shot that he gave to Mr. Clemens could have caused the mass on his buttocks. He told us that this was unlikely. He stated that he had given close to 1,000 B12 shots in his medical career, and they had never seen a complication like the one presented with Mr. Clemens. Uh, the head trainer, we also questioned Tommy Craig, the head trainer. He also told he had never seen a side effect like the one exhibited by Mr. Clemens from a B12 shot in 30 years as a trainer. As well, we asked the assistant trainer, Scott Shannon, in a career of almost 20 years, he said that he had never seen a B12 shot cause that kind of reaction. Based on the MRI results, 
It also appears definitive that the mass was not caused by a strained glute or other muscle strain. In addition, we have Mr. Canseco's testimony that on numerous uh, occasions he had conversations with Mr. Clemens regarding cycling and stacking uh, of steroids as well. Given the, given the physical testimony, uh, the physical evidence that we, we've had there that seems to be consistent with much of, much of what Mr. McNamee is saying, uh, Mr. Clemens, how am I supposed to receive this, this testimony? As someone who's simply looking for the truth and looking at it to be supported by the physical evidence, uh, how, this, this, is not, this is not supportive of your claim. Much of this is supportive of Mr. McNamee's assertions. And I, I just want, as someone who went through all of this, I want you to explain to me the import of, of this evidence. How can, how can this all be wrong? Help me here. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, could I just ask a second? He's inserted into the record a report by uh, Dr. Murphy. Uh, we ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a report by Dr. Burt W. O'Malley, Professor and Chair of Molecular and Cellular Biology. Is Mr. Uh, Davis, the same uh, we thing. will we it will comes have, to a much different conclusion. Yeah, we will, we will take consent. whatever you want into the record, but this is Mr. Lynch's time. Okay. Congressman Lynch, if I if I may, um, I, from what I've understand, we provided everything that we could possibly provide to the staff. Um, we we fully cooperated with everything that was was asked of us. Um, uh, I, I know, obviously, by looking at the medical records, I got a B12 shot, and it obviously uh, gave me some discomfort. Uh, uh, I, I hate to get on Dr. Uh, Taylor, who gave the shot, but he, he, if he gave me a bad shot, um, uh, he gave me a bad shot. I, I don't know uh, how to explain that, but looking at my medical records, and uh, fully cooperated. You know, anytime I need an MRI, I've had many MRIs on my body, so uh, uh, that's, I, I've, again, I don't have any idea, uh, I don't know who the gentleman uh, is that you're, you're expressing this today, uh, but I, all I can tell you is what I know by my medical reports. Uh, we, we've had a Dr. O'Malley uh, review everything, and he concludes there was no steroids. Um, yeah. So I, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm doing every due diligent thing that I can possibly think of, and giving the staff everything that I could possibly think of to look wherever they need to look uh, about this subject. So uh, I, I've not heard that we weren't cooperating on giving you everything that you could possibly need to look, look into this in any, any way, shape, or form. Well, and, and again, there was difficulty. Some of the information came over uh, quite readily. It was difficult to attain uh, others, especially this MRI report. But let's get back well, Mr. to the uh, simple fact that you, you'll have to conclude your time has expired. Okay. Uh, this is not the report of some unknown physician that, that we're contesting here. This is the reports of Dr. Taylor. This is the reports of, uh, of uh, the trainer, uh, Mr. Shannon, uh, and others who, who have said that in over uh, Scott Shannon, uh, Dr. Ron Taylor, and Melvin Thomas Craig, these are, these are people who are very familiar with this. There's probably 60 years of experience here in giving B12 shots. Gentlemen's time uh, has expired. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis, yeah, yeah, you, thank you. I, you I'd ask to, uh, unanimous consent that a uh, commission study looking at the same MRA records uh, done by Bert W. O'Malley, uh, M MD, uh, professor and chair of molecular and cellular biology at Baylor uh, University be admitted into the record. Was this given to you by uh, Mr. Clemens? Uh, it lawyers? was. They, they had this done. Uh, without objection, uh, the, uh, the request will be uh, I mean, practically, I think asking Mr. Clemens to answer a medical technical question like this isn't fair on a report he's never seen before. This was just made available to our side this morning. That's the correct, record. Mr. Congressman. Gentlemen, and, uh, and, and, and Virginia is recognized. And I'd, I'd, I'd also notice, uh, note that Alan Gross, who was the doctor who ordered the MRI and actually is the only doctor here who viewed Mr. Clemens' injury himself, uh, gave a deposition to the committee that will be released this afternoon under oath, uh, and he came to a much different conclusion. He didn't even see an abscess at that point. The only reason he ordered an MRI is because this was Roger Clemens. This was the franchise, and if you see a bruise on your star player, you're going to go get an MRI, and you're not taking any chances. And there was zero evidence at that point, or even suspicion, 
uh, that drugs or anything had caused this. And that deposition, I said, will be released uh, this afternoon. So listen, I, I will just say this was literally a new definition of lynching uh, with the last question that came in asking uh, Mr. Clemens a technical medical question like this on a report that he had never had the opportunity to see before. He's not a doctor. Well, evidently his lawyers were able to get a report for you to give for the record on that issue, so you're not completely taken by surprise. That was an exhibit that they've had before this committee for Mr. Uh, Mr. Waxman for, for weeks. Mr. Chairman, out of respect, I believe the, the committee got the report also. Yeah, they, they, that's I'm, what I'm, I'm saying. They, they've I'm had sure it. I'm sure I've given. They, this has been part of your submissions. That's nothing. There's no surprises here. I just, we didn't, you didn't give this to us special. We just pulled it out of the records. Because I don't think this really tells anybody. No, none of these doctors physically looked at you. They're looking at an MRI and taking a different view. And I'm just saying the doctor who looked at this originally came to a much different conclusion. People can judge whatever they want, but I think what's fair is fair on this. Um, Mr. McNamee, let me just return to you since Mr. The other side seems to be focused on Mr. Clemens. At your deposition, you testified that one of your alleged injections of Winstraw went wrong. Is that correct? I'm not saying one of them. I'm just relating that it possibly that I did it too fast, that it could relate to this abscess. Yeah, you did. Uh, which it, one? I'm not sure. Uh, I think it was the one in the Tampa Bay Clubhouse. Does that ring a bell? I know I, me I mentioned that. But I was just, I didn't know when that trip took place. Well, I'm just trying to get into this abscess question. Okay, yes, that's, that's not as important. Now, when you, you said that when you inject Winstraw too quickly, one of the risks is having an abscess form. Is that correct? That's what I believe. Okay. And you said that you thought that Mr. Clemens developed an abscess? I was told by the head trainer that he developed an abscess. You said that head trainer Tommy Craig told you that? Yes, sir. You said Clemens came to you around this time and said something along the lines of get rid of this stuff. Is that correct? Um, yes, sir. A little bit after his treatment for the abscess, he had come to me and said that. And you interpreted to get rid of this stuff, meaning he did not want to use Winstrel. He, that was your he threw it in my locker and he said get rid of this stuff. So, yes. You said there was a good portion left of the season when he stopped using Winstrel. That was my recollection. Now, if you go back and look at the Blue Jays' schedule for 1998, the team was in Tampa, where, under your testimony, uh, y y you'd noted that it was Tampa. Uh, the testimony would be released today. The team was in Tampa in the middle of June and toward the end of September. As you testified, uh, this botched injection supposedly occurred at the end of July or the beginning of August. Can you reconcile this at this point as you look back on the schedule? Sir, the, bo the, bo the botched injection is just something that I'm, I, I felt bad about that I might have done. I'm not exactly sure it was a botched injection. Uh, that's what I had told the people. But my recollection is your deposition said this happened in the Tampa clubhouse. And I'm just saying the only times they were in Tampa were in the middle of June and the end of September. And as you testified before us, it was at the end of July or the beginning of August. And I'm just saying, could your mem memory be faulty on this? Very much so. Another problem is that head trainer Tommy Craig recalls nothing about any abscess in our conversations with him. Isn't it unusual that Tommy Craig would fail to recollect an injury like this to the star pitcher at the time? Tommy Craig was a trainer for a very long time, and we're talking about 10 years ago. So I'm which sure. You, which you seem to have a very vivid memory of, and, and they, no one else seems to. That's why I told um, in my deposition I, I felt bad because I had assumed it was my fault. If Craig treated an injury to Clemens' buttocks, wouldn't that be something he would recall? This was the start. Uh, you'd have to ask Tommy Craig. Now, he wasn't the only member of the medical team that failed to recall the injury to Mr. Clemens' buttocks. Assistant trainer Scott Shannon, when asked, didn't remember it. Team doctor Ron Taylor didn't remember it. Team orthopedist Alice, Alan Gross who, who ordered uh, the MRI didn't remember. He, he, in, in fact, uh, when in his testimony, he came to a much different conclusion uh, than these after-the-fact people who just looked at the MRI. If Roger Clemens, the most famous pitcher in baseball and really the franchise for the team at that point, at least on their pitching side, had developed an injury known to be the type of injury associated with steroids, wouldn't you expect someone to recollect it along the way? Well, except for you. You're the only one who seems to recollect it. None of those people were, were injecting Roger Clemens with illegal 
steroids in his butt. No, and whether you did or not, I think remains an open question. But the question I'm asking is, we're talking here about an injury to him that was a result of that. And they don't, they did see an injury and they ordered an MRI as a result of that. But none of the alarms went off. Now, the medical records show that Clemens had some type of injury to his buttocks at the end of July. There's no question about that. But according to the MRI, it was not an abscess. It was simply described as a palpable mass. In layman's terms, this could have simply been a bruise. Are you certain that Tommy Craig told you that Clemens had an abscess? Yes, I'm certain. Okay. Both head trainer Tommy Craig and team doctor Ron Taylor told us the MRI was ordered because they thought the bruise or buttocks injury may have been caused by a muscle tear. The MRI was not ordered to look for an abscess. The MRI was ordered because the team's star pitcher was injured. Now that you know Tommy Craig, Scott Shannon, Ron Taylor, Dr. Gross all say no abscess and no memory of this injury, you still stand by your allegation that he had an abscess. It's not my allegation. It was, he was getting treated for an abscess diagnosed by the head trainer and he was getting treated with ultrasound, which it was right over the, the area, the ultrasound was right over the area where I injected Roger Clemens with Winstrel. Okay. Now, Dr. Taylor says he gave two B12 shots in his life, and one was to Roger Clemens in July of 1998, which was the time of the injury and was not in Tampa. Uh, the medical records also say Clemens started complaining of soreness in his buttocks after receiving this injection. How can you be so sure this buttocks injury was not the result of the B12 shot, since that is the only shot that could have taken place uh, at that point. The, the Tampa, where you alleged originally this took place, were going to be in June and September. How do you reconcile that? I'm not sure I follow your question. Well, the question is simple. The, the only time they were in Tampa where you testified this took place was in June and September. This injury took place in July, the MRI, July, August time frame. And we know that he received a, a shot for B12 during that time. So if there's any kind of shot or abscess, it would have had to be the B12 shot. It couldn't have been the steroid shot you're talking about because they weren't in Tampa at the time. I know, but you're, you're, you misunderstood the deposition then because what happened was I assumed not knowing when the Tampa trip was, I just said because that was a hurried, a hurried um, instance where we were in the closet and that's where the injection took place. But I was unaware of the dates, and my recollection Yes, was you were unaware of the dates, which is why we have an inconsistency here. Right, I wasn't aware of the dates. That's right, you weren't. And, and now that you are, it, it makes your statement inconsistent, because this took place in the July-August time frame where they weren't in Tampa. Let me ask you this, Mr. McNamee. Why did you inject professional athletes with substances you knew to be forbidden or illegal uh, as a former police officer? Well, it was something I shouldn't have done, and I'm ashamed for it, and that's why I'm here today. Why did you keep doing it? I believe I haven't since 2002. But why did you keep doing it for as many years? I just accepted it as the norm and it was part of the culture of baseball. How prevalent was it? Excuse me? Hmm? Excuse me? How prevalent was this in, the, in clubhouses uh, across uh, baseball at the time? I think with the, within the players it was pretty prevalent and I'm not sure about other strength coaches and their, and their uh, involvement. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, Mr. Shays, I'll yield to you. Just. Just listening to your testimony, you said you believe you haven't uh, injected anyone with any illegal uh, drugs since 2002. Uh, what does the word believe mean? Did you or didn't you? Um, I wasn't really, uh, I, about ball players. I haven't, but I, inject, I instructed Debbie Clemens in 2003, Thank 2002. You. I, let me ask a question before our time runs out. Did you ever tell Andy Pettit you were contemplating suing Hendrick Sports Management? I might have. Did you ever contemplate litigation against the LA Times following the stories relating to Jason Grimsley's affidavit? Yes, I did. Okay. Gentlemen's time has expired. Just for the record, as I understand it, there was an injury on Mr. Clemens' buttocks. This was in the team records. And in the records, it said that the injury was related to an injection. Do any of you disagree with those three statements? No. Okay. No. 
you know, from, Mr. Chairman, let me just add, and there was an injection of a B12, B12 injection. shot, from what I understand in my medical one, reports. That's one contention. The other contention, it was an injection of something else. But those three points that I made, uh, for the record, are accurate. Uh, Mr. Kanjorski is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in an attempt not to have Mr. Sheeter appear to be a potted plant, I'm going to talk with you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I, I gather you were instrumental in preparing the Mitchell report. Is that correct? I did assist Senator Mitchell. Yes, Excuse me. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. No, no, no. I did assist Senator, right. Senator Mitchell. Yes, Congressman. Okay. If you pull that a little closer to you, when you get to be my age, you lose about 20 percent <laughs> of your hearing capacity. And I just don't want to embarrass the other younger citizens in the audience. Okay. Uh, let, let me uh, preface my remarks with one or two comments. I have the highest regard for Senator Mitchell. As a matter of fact, at one time he was my uh, proposed candidate for president. So, uh, and I've known him for more than a quarter of a century. So, any of the remarks that I make to you or questions I ask of you are not intended to impugn his credibility or his reliability. But having been involved in Washington in a few years, and noting that the Mitchell report was quite extensive, in excess of 400 pages. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, I know George Mitchell is a very dedicated person, but I don't suspect that George Mitchell wrote every one of those 400 pages in his own handwriting or even by his own dictation. Is that uh, reasonable to assume? He did not do the first draft of every word. He did not do the first draft of every word, but I will tell you that he reviewed every sentence, every comma, every so semicolon on multiple so, occasions. So would you say that he substantially stands by every fact set forth in that report? Everything that we said in the report was at the time we wrote the report, we had a good faith belief for it. And we, we had a what? We had a good faith belief for it, and we believed it to be true. Okay. Have you changed that opinion now? No. You, you believe every fact set forth in the report is true as set forth? Sitting here at this moment, I cannot think of a single fact that we would um, recant, no. So, so this supposed meeting that occurred at the uh, yeah. uh, Conseco's, Conseco's house, uh, you've reviewed that and he is told a lie? and uh, the people that reported the ball game, they've told a lie? Is that correct? Or did that meeting not occur? Did it or didn't it occur? That's the question. I would say at this point, we're not in a, we're, it's not our role to judge what the subsequent facts are whoa, if they've come whoa, to play. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean but, to tell me if you're going to uh, say I committed perjury or lied about some substantial fact, and, and in doing that, you placed me at a particular location, and then it turns out that you couldn't possibly have been there and you weren't there. That's not material to your report? Well, let me, let me try and put the Canseco lunch into perspective then for you. Obviously, Mr. McNamee told Senator Mitchell that Mr. Clemens had been at Mr. Canseco's right. house for a luncheon. And this, I would, I, I would add, uh, is, is an instance which shows it's one of, one of the reasons why we would have liked to have talked to the current uh, players I, because I, I, we could have gotten additional facts. Right. We would but have liked to have talked to God to find out, but you didn't. We would you have relied liked to talk on to the one players. witness and he put Mr. Clement at a location that supposedly other impartial parties have provided affidavits that he wasn't there and couldn't have been there. Now my question to you is the writer of that report, and I'll assume mm -hmm. you're the writer of that report. Which of those facts is this committee and the public of the United States to accept? Did this meeting occur where the conversation of steroids occurred, or didn't it? Well, well let, me, let me take issue with a premise of your question, because it's important to understand that at that meeting, we do not write that any conversations about steroids took place at the Jose Canseco luncheon. Okay. Assume, we, assume we, you, assume if you I could just, if I could complete my statement. I only have five minutes, so I don't want you to filibuster. We're used to the Senate doing that, but we don't do that in the House. So I want you to respond as quickly as you can so we can move through these facts. If you I'll will. do my best. Okay. Now, you, you, now are you contending that the fact that that meeting occurred and whether or not Mr. Clement was there is not important and is meaningless and shouldn't have been in the record? Or was it placed there 
for some purpose to show that there could have been a semi-conspiracy occurring and discussions being had, and this was just another element of that evidence. What, what is it? This was placed in the, in the report in large part because of the fact that we also interviewed Jose Canseco. And Mr. Canseco advised us that he had had repeated conversations Didn't with he with advise Mr. you that that meeting did not occur under oath? Well, he was not under oath when we spoke to him. We did not have the ability to, to place people under oath. Okay. So, we, so, so now are you concluding that what he did, did he tell you that meeting did not occur? He, he did not answer that question because we did not ask it. At the time we interviewed Mr. Canseco, that was July 11, 2006, in Fullerton, California. At that time, we did not know of this issue of the Canseco lunch. Mr. So Kujorski, we didn't ask your, him. Uh, yeah, your time has questions. expired. Could I just close with the last question? Okay. Please, go ahead. No one objects. Are we assuming now in this hearing, did that meeting occur or didn't that meeting occur? I think you can draw your own judgments. I have heard, I have heard since the report came out, evidence suggesting that Mr. Clemens was at the lunch, evidence suggesting Mr. Clemens was not at the lunch. The one point I would like to make about that lunch is that Senator Mitchell did not state in the report that there was either performance enhancing substance use discussed, nor were any performance enhancing substances exchanged during the course of that luncheon. Elmer's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Micah for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. McNamee, um, you've come up uh, with uh, so-called physical evidence uh, of possible steroid use uh, that um, I believe you turned over to investigators? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And is that, uh, as I understand it, there's gauze? Yes, I can't hear you very well. As I understand it, there's gauze and there's a syringe. Yes, sir. Is that the extent of it? The physical evidence? There is empty, uh, broken amples that were used with those syringes. Um, there is some unused um, amples, about seven or eight of them, I believe. There's also about 30 or so two-inch needle heads along with a bottle of white pills, along with the evidence. Okay. The, um, the gauze that I saw looked like it had some blood stains on it. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that blood would, uh, if it was DNA tested, you think it would be uh, uh, Mr. Clemens? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and you could have had gauze with his blood stains on it uh, because you had done several injection procedures on him and also treated him. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Mr. Clements claims that he was treated with uh, vitamin B12, I guess it was, and you, did you do some in, of those injections? I'm, I, I can't hear you, sir. I said, Mr. Clemens uh, has said that you treated him with uh, injections of vitamin B12. Is that correct? Negative. You never did any B12? No, sir. Okay. Uh, what color is this? Well, then you claim you gave him a s steroid or a compound. Uh, what, what was it that you claim that uh, you gave him the injections of? Oh, it was throughout the course of the years, it was Winstrel, also known as Stanzanol. Mm -hmm. There was testosterones, steroids, and HGH, human growth hormone. Uh, what, what colors are the um, testosterone, the, uh, the, the various um, liquids that... The Winstrel, uh, the Stanzanol from 98 was a, a, like a powdery white or a milky white liquid um, water base somewhat. The testosterones were more of an oily, clear to a little bit darker, almost like a honey color. And the HGH, once it was mixed with the diluted water, it would become clear. 
so basically clear to honey tone. Uh, Mr. And Milky Cle White. Mr. Clemens, you so. claim that uh, you did admit that you were injected with vitamin B12 and um, also um, uh, you admitted to uh, lidocaine. Okay. What color is the uh, vitamin B12 shot? You, you told me you had uh, quite a few shots. Brian McNamee uh, gave me shots of, on four to six occasions of B12. It, it's red or pink in color. Lidocaine, I, have, I do not know the color of lidocaine. Mm -hmm. He gave me one shot of lidocaine uh, in my lower back. Um, and that happened in Toronto. I, I have no idea. No, he could have uh, gauze with your, uh, with your blood sample on it. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, but you have said that the only two injected substances you had that you, and it, was it, was it uh, uh, Mr. McNamee that, uh, that injected those two substances? That's correct. Okay. Um, and you, you also said that the, you knew very distinctively the color of the B12 because you'd had that injection. And, and that's a fairly distinctive color. That is correct. It was and red or pinkish in color. And what color was what he injected you uh, when, when uh, you thought it was B12? I'm sorry? What color was it when he injected you when you thought it was B12? It was red and pink. B12 was red pink that he gave me. I, I don't remember the color of the lidocaine. It was one shot. He told me it would give me uh, some freeness in my back. Uh, so, so we may never know because he may, he may in fact, uh, and you say he would have gauze with possib your, possibly your blood DNA sample on it. That would be correct? He sure could have. Okay. Uh, but we don't know what uh, he injected, but he, he, he just testified that the substance was a different color than, than, uh, than in fact you recognized. And, uh, in fact, you told me on a prior occasion the color of the substance you were injected in with. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I didn't. I said, you told me the color of the substance you were injected with. That's why I asked him that That's correct. question That's uh, correct. first. So you, you, don't time think, has you don't think he's telling the truth then? Brian McNamee has never given me growth hormone or steroids. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Malone, do you want to take your five minutes now? Yes, okay. thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Clemens, as a New Yorker, we are very proud of your you. professional achievements. Uh, thank you for your many efforts to help children through your foundation. And uh, you, are, you are an important role model to many young people. And I am uh, concerned about these allegations against you and your conflicting response uh, to many of them. Uh, first of all, the, the Mitchell Report was released in December of 2007. And, and after it was issued, you began speaking out against these allegations. One question that I have is why did you refuse to talk to Senator Mitchell when he reached out to you before the report was released? And specifically on page 175 of his report, it says, and I quote, in order to provide Clemens with information about these allegations and to give him an opportunity to respond, I asked him to meet with me and he declined, end quote. As part of your public statements, you went on 60 Minutes. And during an interview with Mike Wallace, he asked you, why didn't you speak to George Mitchell's uh, investigators? And in response, you stated, and I quote, I listened to my counsel. I was advised not to. A lot of the players did not go down and talk to him as well. And do you remember saying that to Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes? Yes. Mr. Clemens, in your deposition with our, our committee, you gave a very different explanation. You did not uh, tell us your lawyers told you not to speak to Senator Mitchell. You repeatedly told us you had no idea Senator Mitchell wanted to talk to you. And let me give you some examples sure. from the transcript. Sure. First, on page 112 uh, of your deposition, you were asked, were you aware that Senator Mitchell was seeking to interview you? And your answer was, I was not. Then later on page 112, Senator Mitchell sent a letter to the Players Union 
in July of 2007 requesting an interview with you and, and uh, you were not, you, you, you uh, testified that you were not aware of this uh, request. You said I was not aware of it. Then on page 117, when Mr. Hendricks, your agent, heard about the invitation, did he communicate with you that you were invited to talk to Senator Mitchell and your agent, uh, you answered that he did not even communicate this request to you. Then on page 115 in the July uh, time framework, your agent uh, Hendricks never said to you, by the way, Senator Mitchell wants to talk to you. And your answer was, that is correct. Then on page 116 in October, Senator Mitchell informed the players union that any player who agreed to an interview would be provided with the evidence that Senator Mitchell had. Did you know of this in 2007? And your answer was, I did not. And then you made this definitive statement, and I quote, I had no idea that Senator Mitchell wanted to talk to me. If it was about baseball and steroids in general, I would have wanted to see him. And obviously, if I knew what Brian McNamee was saying about me in this report, I would have been there, end quote. So, Mr. Clemens, there were six times that you told our committee under oath that you had no idea that Mitchell wanted to talk to you. Yet you said on national television that you refused to talk to Senator Mitchell as at, on the advice of your attorneys. So I have two questions about this. First, why did you give one explanation on 60 Minutes for why you failed to talk to Senator Mitchell and a different explanation in the depositions before this committee? Congresswoman, the fact of the matter was I was never told uh, by my baseball agent slash attorney that uh, we are asked to uh, come down and uh, see Senator Mitchell. Like you said in that statement, if I knew the lies that Brian McNamee were telling about me, I would have been down there to see Senator Mitchell in a heartbeat, in a New York minute, if you will. Um, I was never told about that. The Players Association, from my understanding, reached out to a lot of the players. I don't believe uh, any player went down other than, from what I understand, Jason Giambi. Um, and it was relayed to Mr. Hendricks, who you stated uh, his name in that, uh, my earlier uh, testimony. It, it was never uh, brought to me. From talking to Randy Hendricks and um, I believe the Players Association, uh, in my situation, I had to answer allegations back in 2006 about an L.A. Times report. But, but would, would you say then that, that uh, your agents did you a terrible disservice by not uh, bringing this information to you, that you had an opportunity to talk before the report came out? Um, I, I would say so. Uh, and, and, with and, all, and can I ask what ask actions did you take after you learned that your agents kept from you Senator Mitchell's inquiry? I would say that if the Ethics Committee in the House uh, sent me a letter about uh, a possible illegal action and my staff kept this information from me, um, I, I would have fired my staff. And so my question to you, have you fired these agents that did not inform you about this? What action have you taken with this uh, really breach of trust? No, no I haven't. And uh, with all respect, Senator Mitchell, um, uh, from what I understand, again, was asked by uh, members of the Players Association, um, what, do you, what, what do you have to talk about with these players? And would you please tell us what it is? And they said, we're not going to respond to that. You'll have to come down and see us. My time has expired. Thank, Thank the gentlelady. Uh, Mr. Souter for five minutes. Thank you. This has been uh, uh, very frustrating. I'm sure it's been very frustrating to those who are watching, too. Uh, when you testify in front of this committee, it's better not to talk about the past than to lie about the past. Somebody's not telling the truth today. Now, I, I'm disappointed that the other witnesses are not here. And I understand from the chairman that we plan to release those depositions. And I hope the public understands that what we're having today is a very short form. I went through most of these depositions last night, hundreds of pages. And when this is released, you're going to get somewhat of a more comprehensive view What's interesting today is to see the interaction, but I, I would argue that those depositions are fairly uh, devastating. Mr. McNamee, uh, there was something that caught my attention that I would like to raise. It was a side comment fairly far into your testimony. You um, 
were discussing related issues and you alleged that David Cohn, a player rep for, I believe then, the Toronto Blue Jays, said, quote, the owners want the union, uh, the owners went to the union and said, we don't want to test, but you've got to give us some valid excuse to go to the media. Do you have any more knowledge of that and is that accurate characterization of what you said? Because that is an incredible allegation here because the union has been being blamed for not testing and that there hasn't been an investigation of the owners thus far and what you're saying is a player rep went uh, to who and said that? Did you hear the second hand, third hand? The, the player rep came to me and that's what was told to me. And why that, did he, that, those statements. And why did he come to you? Um, because of my background and he wanted to know, he was talking to me on the back of the plane about the current state, which reverts back to, um, I guess, I believe it was, two, yeah, it was 2000. And I think the, he, they were just, it was just a conversation. And he, and he thought maybe I, had, maybe I had some knowledge that might have led to believe that um, steroid use w didn't enhance hand-eye coordination, which is what his baseball is mainly depicted as, as far as ability. But Mr. Chairman, um, I know you don't want to have another hearing. I'm not ag advocating another hearing. But the Mitchell report was not targeted towards the ownership. And it's one thing we haven't investigated. This is a second to third hand type of, of revelation. But I think that the staff needs to look at this because this comes with a core question of the legislation that you, I, Congressman Cummings, Congressman Davis, and Senator McCain introduced about whether we can trust baseball to, in fact, do testing on themselves. And if it's true that the owners wanted to, in effect, cover up and not have testing, this is a very serious allegation. Well, I thank the gentleman for his comment. That, we'll um, I also, uh, uh, Mr. McNamee, um, when he held the press conference and played the tape live to the national media, that appears to really have ticked you off. Yes, sir. Uh, you made a reference in your deposition that that's when you produced the physical evidence. Yes. Um, that do you believe that physical evidence, uh, friend Mr. Micah was questioning, uh, yes, there'll be blood. Mr. Clemens said that the blood could be from a number of other things. Do you believe that physical evidence will tie it directly to an illegal drug? Yes, I do. Do you believe it can be debated whether or not, in other words, will it be on the needle or something that clearly takes the DNA to that? Uh, have you ever handled physical evidence when you were a policeman? The physical evidence? Yes, like this, uh, you, how to, how to no, track it, I've, how to protect it, what it's likely to show. So you're, are you speculating at this point? Uh, or do you know, in fact, that the DNA will be traced to HGH or steroids? I'm speculating. Okay. The, uh, because uh, the DNA, uh, if it's clear, will not just remember. In other words, it will help settle the debate. But if there's a dispute, whether it was B12 or that, it, that even could be confusing. But I think it's important for the record because I, I chaired the Narcotics Committee for a long time, and I can't tell you how much these depositions look like any kind of narcotics debate we have. It looks like cocaine. It looks like methamphetamine. And when you, when you talked in your testimony about lying in the early stages, we often see witnesses who are caught, who go to the federal government and initially give up just enough so they think they're not going to go to jail, but they don't really turn over their major clients. And then something ticks them off and they go a step further. And uh, that could be another explanation, but it may be, if it doesn't show the tracking, that it's going to be very difficult to resolve. But the other reason, Mr. Chairman, I think it's very important that you've committed to release the depositions is, is that, in fact, Mr. McNamee has been verified by Mr. Knobloch is accurate. He's been verified by Mr. Pettit is accurate. He, uh, Radomski, who was under federal investigation, supports a lot of that, although we don't have a deposition on him. And one last thing, it would have been great to have Mr. Knobloch here today because it was a sad testimony that he had about his life experiences and about how he wanted to come clean for his family. I urge people to read that. And if I could make one last thing, I am incredibly disappointed with the players and the pressure that they put on it comes through all these depositions about not to talk. 
If families in America don't talk about the drug abuse in their neighborhoods, and the locker room would be your neighborhoods, if you don't talk about that drug abuse, there was a family in Baltimore that Congressman Cummings and I did a bill on, the Dawson family, that their house was firebombed, that all of them were killed, all their children, because they talked. And yet baseball players somehow, and management and trainers, think they're above it, that there's some kind of a snitch, that there's some kind of a, a thing wrong if you talk about other players. The fact is we can't get control of drug abuse unless you turn over other people and cooperate. And this wall of silence coming out of baseball has been disgusting. And it took the federal government, the Balco case, to get anything out of this. Then it took the hearings to get the Mitchell report. And now we've got all kinds of questions coming off that of whether management was in fact involved. When people say that there should not be an independent test, I don't see how, given this track record, they think there can be anything but independent testing. Thank, thank you for your thank patience. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Souter. Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Clemens, um, at our previous hearing in 2005, uh, one witness clearly misled this committee. Another temporarily lost his ability to speak and understand the English language, uh, while a third witness decided that he didn't want to talk about the past. Uh, you have four sons, and you understand how young athletes admire players of your caliber. Uh, can I look at my two children uh, with a straight face and tell them that you, Roger Clemens, have, play, have always played the game with honesty and integrity? Yes, sir. And there that, that would be no, no doubt that that's true. Without a question. I took no shortcuts. I can tell you about my, my upbringing. There were you know, I've heard the thing about pampered athletes and million dollar ball players. I've heard that from my own counsel, and I take a little offense to that for the fact that my father passed away when I was nine years old. My mother, I was raised by great, strong women, my mother and my grandmother. They gave me my will, my determination. Um, I've had my work ethic, which again has come in question here by a man at this table, that he made me. He made me who I was. I didn't meet him until 1998. In 1997, I won the Triple Crown in pitching. I already had over 200 wins. But he coaxed me on a statement. He says he coaxed me to four Cy Youngs. And if you do the math, I would have nine Cy Youngs according to his math. And I don't. You have seven. I have seven. Thank you. Um, my career, Mr. Congressman, didn't happen by accident. I worked extremely hard. I've had a great work ethic since I was in high school. I didn't have a car in high school. I ran home, which my condominium or town home was about two miles from my house. Uh, my sister reminded me that, you, that when you went to the University of Texas, the only way I was going to further my education, my mother didn't have the means. She worked three jobs. She didn't have the means to send me to college. So it came through the game of baseball, which we love. So it's very... It's very hurtful to me and my family and to the children that look up to us. The congressman earlier, I guess he stepped out. My innocent sister-in-law was murdered, brutally murdered, because of drugs. It hurt our family. My mother pulled my other athletic brother, my, my middle brother, if you will, my next older brother, I have two brothers and three sisters, out of college because of an incident that happened on camp, campus in, involving marijuana. Pulled him out of campus and, and I tipped my hat to my brother. He went on to finish school and get his degree. These are the values that we have, that I have, and that I'll continue to have. Somebody's tried to break my spirit in this room. They're not going to break my spirit. I'm going to continue to go out and do the things that I love to do and try and be honest and genuine to every person I can be. It's the way I was brought up. It's what I know. But you can tell your, your, your boys that I did it the right way, and I worked my butt off to do it. Thank you for that response. You have a very compelling and telling story about your life and career. A colleague of mine, Mr. Capuano in Massachusetts, wants to know what uniform you will wear to the Hall mm -hmm. of Fame. <laughs> can I ask you that I... May I state that I didn't hear that question? That's fine. That's fine. Let me ask Mr. Uh, McNamee. Uh, sir, when you first 
spoke to the government about this matter, did you deny that Roger Clemens ever used steroids or HGH? No, sir. You never denied it to the federal authorities? No, sir. Okay. Uh, I recognize how intense the pressure can be when testifying for federal prosecutors. Uh, did their intimidation tactics influence you to give conflicting testimony? No, sir. You sure about that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Were you granted five years probation in exchange for your testimony? No, sir. You don't have a deal sitting on the table with federal prosecutors? No, sir. To, to come before this committee and to, to say what you've said? You don't have a deal at all? No deal, sir. Were you simply telling the prosecutors what they wanted to hear in order to secure a deal for yourself? No, sir. You've answered truthfully to all my questions. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for Thank you, Mr. Clay. Time. Your time has expired. The Chair is going to take his uh, time for questioning. Um, Mr. Clemens, I'm puzzled about something that happened last week, and I'd like you to help me understand why you did what you did. Okay. Uh, you have a tough job today. You, you said you find it very hard to have to prove a negative. But your attorneys have provided documentation to rebut the passage in the Mitchell report about a party at Jose Canseco's house. I, I don't view this passage as anything central uh, to the issue before us, but it's important that we know if it's true. And your attorneys and you have been very forceful in telling us that the report is wrong. You were not at Jose Canseco's house between June 8th and June 10th, 1998, when the Toronto Blue Jays were playing in Miami. During your deposition, you were asked, uh, could you have been at this house during this, this time period, June 8th to June 10, 1998? And you answered no. Is that, is that a correct statement? The, on the date, sir? Uh, did you answer no to the question whether you were at Jose Canseco's party? If you repeat your question, then I can, please. Well, during your deposition, you, said, you were asked, could you have been at his house during this time period, which was June 8th to 10th, 1998? And you answered no. Uh, you've given us supporting materials. You provided an affidavit from Jose Canseco that said that you were not at his house during the team party on June 9th. You provided a golf receipt from 8.58 a.m. on June 9th, which showed that at least that morning you were purchasing merchandise at the golf course next to Canseco's house. And you provided excerpts from a baseball broadcast that reported that you were not at the team party. And these came up uh, when several other members asked you about it. It's all very helpful. When the committee took Mr. McNamee's deposition, he had a completely different recollection, as he has today. He had a clear recollection of, that Mr. Clemens was at Mr. Conseco's home. So our committee staff investigated this issue. And we received conflicting evidence. I'm not surprised by conflicting recollections of a party of around 10 years ago. Um, that was really of no special importance. But Jose Canseco thinks Roger Clemens and Mr. Canseco's ex-wife weren't at the party. Mr. Canseco's ex-wife, Jessica Fisher, believes that she was there and so was Debbie Clemens. Mr. McNamee told us that one key witness who would know whether you were at Canseco's house for that party was your former nanny. And the committee staff asked your attorneys for her name last Friday so we could contact her. We made additional requests for her name and contact information over the weekend. Around 5 p.m. on Sunday afternoon, committee staff made another request and asked your attorneys to refrain from contacting the aunt nanny before the committee staff could speak with her. It wasn't until Monday afternoon that your attorneys provided the nanny's name and phone number to the committee. And it wasn't until yesterday that the committee staff actually spoke with the nanny. Uh, are you aware of all this time frame, uh, I, timeline about the nanny? I'm, I'm not sure of all the, the, the time frame. I know that, okay. uh, yeah. Well, what the nanny said to us when we finally contacted her yesterday was important in several respects. First, she said that she was at Mr. Conseco's home during the relevant time period. In fact, she said 
that she and Mrs. Clemens and the children stay overnight at the Consecos. Second, she, secondly, she told us she did not remember any team party as described in the Mitchell report. And third, she said that she did not, she did remember that you were at that home during the relevant time period, although she didn't know how long you stayed or whether you spent the night, night with your family. The third point directly contradicted your deposition testimony, um, where you said you were not at Mr. Conseco's home at any point June 8th mm. to June 10th, 1998. But it's entirely understandable to me it was 10 years ago. Here's what puzzles me about your actions. We have a transcript of the interview with the nanny, whose name I'm not going to release to protect her private privacy. But in this transcript, she says that on Sunday, this last Sunday, you called her and asked her to come to your Houston home. She had not seen you in person since 2001. But after you called, she went to your home on Sunday afternoon. And I'd like to read a portion of the transcript of the committee sure. interview. Question, when you said you didn't remember a party, what did he say? Answer, he says, you know, the reason you don't remember that party is because I wasn't there. He said, because I, I know that he was playing with Jose. Question, so did he ask you, do you remember a party, and then you said you did not remember a party? Answer, that's right. She also told the committee staff that you told her that she should tell the committee the truth. And after your meeting, an investigator working for you called her and asked her a series of additional questions. Your meeting took place two days after the committee staff made a simple request for your former nanny's name. And then it took 24 hours after your meeting for your attorneys to provide her name to the Republican and Democratic staffs. And that's why I'm puzzled about this. Uh, wh why, wh what was it your idea? Why, what was it, was it your idea to meet with her before forwarding her name to us, or did someone suggest that to you? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that uh, just like through this whole hearings, I was doing you all a favor by finding a nanny that was supposedly came in question. Well, you'd, so. you, you might have been trying to do us a favor, but who told you you should invite her to your house to, that you haven't seen her in all those Mr. years? Mr. Chairman, this is unfair. What his lawyers tell him is unfair to me. Okay, well, I accept that. I accept that. I accept that. Uh, well, gentlemen, please be seated. Um, <laughs> was it your idea? That's, a, that's the appropriate. Idea. Was it your idea? It was my idea to investigate what witnesses know. Okay. Like any other lawyer in the free world does. Did you think, Mr. Um, Clemens, it was a good idea no. to invite her to your home on Sunday after not seeing her for seven years? Okay. I'm sorry? Did you think it was a good idea to invite, your, invite her to your home after you hadn't seen her for seven years? I was uh, told on Friday night to um, see if you, you know, we could locate the... Uh -huh. uh, the uh, nanny. We'll leave. Obviously, it's very nice. To, I don't think that she needs any publicity, but um, we, I was told on Friday night that you guys may want to talk to her. And so. And you felt you should talk to her first. Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's anything improper I, in this. Mr. Chairman, I ain't talked to her uh, in, in years, and I did everything I could to locate her to if you guys had any questions for her. And I did tell her to answer truthfully. I don't, I, again, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I don't know if there's anything improper in this, but I do know it sure raises an appearance of impropriety. The impression it leaves is terrible. The right way to have handled this would have been to give the committee information immediately, to not have your people interview the nanny before we did, and certainly for you not to personally talk to her about the interview as you did. Uh, one option for you was to have given the committee the nanny's contact information and had no contact with her. Another option could have been to give her a heads up that the committee would be calling her. But you chose, I think, the worst approach. That's my opinion. You oh, invited her to your home, you had a specific conversation about whether you were at Mr. Conseco's house, and you did this before you gave the committee her contact information. Mr. Mr. Chairman, is there anything all, else you want to add? In all due respect, this is nothing but innuendo. Your committee asked on Friday evening for this information, we have done everything to give you that information in a fast and in a thorough manner. The innuendo is terrible, and I spoke to your own staff member who's speaking with you now. And, and your statement is done, is, and I have the highest respect for the chairman, is, is calculated to do nothing but to have innuendo against this man. We have cooperated well, I understand your fully as your own staff member. Gentlemen, uh, as I indicated, the, the rules do not allow the lawyers to speak, but I did not cut you off. Thank you. Uh, this action means 
there's always going to be a question uh, whether you try to influence her testimony. And I gather Mr. Mr. Your Chairman, lawyer thinks that's Mr. Chairman, I was doing you all a favor, and uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, I haven't seen this lady in a long time. She's a sweet lady, and I wanted her to get her to you as quick as possible if you had any questions for her. A again, I'm hurt by those statements that I would uh, get in the way of finding anything that you guys were looking for. That's, I I'm hurt by that statement. We okay. asked her to come before the, uh, the House. So the gentleman is not going to be uh, recognized. Um, my time is up. Uh, Ms. Norton is here. And I want to recognize her for uh, five minutes to ask a question she might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I want to <clears throat> thank uh, both Mr. McNamee and Mr. Clemens for having the guts to show up here uh, without uh, ha having been subpoenaed. Uh, Mr. Clemens, uh, much of, of what we're about here turns on concrete evidence, but much of it on credibility. And my questions really go to your longstanding relationship uh, with Mr. McAmey. You know, we almost 10 years of relationship from 98 uh, with the Blue Jays until 2007. And a whole string of, of uh, evidence about the closeness of that relationship. Uh, you training with him in Kentucky, uh, got you Bruce Springsteen, you got him. Uh, Bruce uh, Springsteen tickets, I call that love. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you lent him uh, fishing gear. And to quote, to quote uh, your statement, I trusted him, put my faith in him, and brought him around my family and my children. I treated him just like I've done others I've met in my life, like family. That's pretty close. Uh, so, so isn't it fair to say you were on quite good terms with Mr. McEnany Mac until you found out uh, what he told Senator Mitchell. Um, Congresswoman, uh, I did not get him Bruce Springsteen tickets. Um, well, let us correct the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, um, I trusted Brian McEnany like I trusted every other trainer or well, um, I quoted you on how you trust yes, him. Yes, I, I totally understand. But I asked you, therefore, don't your own statements show that you were on good terms with him until you found out what he told Senator Mitchell? I, I was on, I would say I was on uh, good terms with him. I, we had a, a, obviously what I've learned now. Um, yeah, but you see, I'm not I'm talking sorry. about now. I'm, now is after the Mitchell report. Um, of course, you and, and your legal team are raising uh, very serious questions about incidents in Mr. Uh, uh, McAmey's past. Some of them were public, some of them were not. But I think they would cause reasonable people to lose trust and confidence in Mr. McAmey. For example, that he gave you without your knowledge what you later came to believe while he's still your trainer uh, and, and amphetamine. Indeed, you described a confrontation, your word, that you had with him about this particular incident. Uh, you told us that he falsely claimed uh, that your own workout was his and how you bit your lip uh, and your tongue as you watched him do this. You, you, you even say that a company associated with the McNamee Act, use your, your image uh, in an advertisement without your consent. And finally, of course, perhaps uh, most personally, that Mr. McMe injected your wife with HGH in your master bedroom without your knowledge. And you described here in prior testimony today some of the repercussions uh, she had from that injection. Now, you were well aware of all of these concerns before the Mitchell report was released. So I've got to ask you, sir, if Mr. McAmey did all of these things, and they appear not to be in doubt, uh, including injecting your wife with uh, HGH without your knowledge, why did you continue to employ him? Congresswoman, I. Uh, the incident that uh, 
that uh, he told me from the St. Pete uh, situation that he got let go from the Yankees. Uh, I was told a different story. I was told that he saved a woman's life. That again, he took a hit for five other guys on that situation. I believe I worked. What about what he did to you, Mr. Clemens? What about the incidents I have said and how right. serious that seriously they affected you? Why did you continue to employ him given what he had done to you? That's correct. And what I was, uh, uh, the point I was getting to, um, I believe there was a work stoppage for uh, two or three months. I believe Mr. Pettit uh, uh, was playing again. Uh, we continued to play. I was in, still trying to make up my mind again. I'm not real, I'm not great at retirement. I've tried to retire three times. It's not working. Um, but uh, there was a work stoppage there. There was a work stoppage with him uh, until uh, after the incident with my wife, which he again um, earlier he said that, that he directed. Excuse me, work stoppage. Where I didn't hire him as a trainer. I actually had a, a, a different trainer for two months that I worked with. And the with. reason for that was um, I was going in a different direction. Um, um, so and then you had him as your trainer again. I'm sorry? And then you had him as your trainer again. Uh, I did. And, um, uh, uh, yeah, my I believe question, he was Mr. Mr. Clements, is why did you keep the man? It's very simple. Why did you keep the man? He did some pretty horrendous things, which are on the record, which you yourself said. Why did you keep him? And why only after the Mitchell report uh, did you, your your relationship with him in? Well, Brian McNamee, again, uh, we had a heated discussion. He apologized to me uh, on the situation with, with my wife. Uh, How about the other things? I'm, I'm a forgiving person. I don't, uh, like I said, I, I don't, uh, when he told me that he was a doctor and he had a PhD, I had no reason to look behind that. I mean, he was employed by Major League Baseball. He ran an ad. Uh, and, and basically, I let him have it about that, told him about it, that you cannot do that kind of stuff. Uh, I think that's when he said that he was going to sue my baseball attorney. And um, uh, quite often, it happens in my life. Uh, I was, uh, the other day, I had a gentleman come and talk to me about uh, that they were excited that they just bought a lot down from my house uh, in the, the, the area that they were playing golf in. And I let them know that. Uh, I, I hate to burst their bubble, but I don't have a lot at that house, so it happens quite often. Um, again, Chairman, I, just I learned, I learned, uh, Ms. Congresswoman, I, I learned, like I said, about the that I had no reason to believe that he wasn't a doctor, and these obviously the lies that I know now that he's told me, uh, and all the stuff that he did to you, uh, Mr. Mr. Clemens. All I can say is, I'm sure you're going to heaven. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Norton. We're going to uh, take a 15-minute break, and then we'll reconvene and continue the questioning. of the committee will come back to order. Uh, Mr. Davis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, while I was gone, I know the Chairman asked some questions about uh, an affidavit from uh, uh, or an interview with Lily Strain. Uh, this has to do with a very critical issue uh, that the two of you um, 
have um, don't seem to agree on, and that is a party at Jose Canseco's house. Um, we have an affidavit from Mr. Conseco and his wife saying they remember you not being there and being hurt that you weren't there. We have uh, contemporaneous sportscaster reports noting that you were not there. We have your golf uh, uh, ticket that you've given us that is, shows you probably couldn't have been there, although maybe it, it's possible. Um, we have um, a, a number of other people who were interviewed say they don't remember you there. So when they talk to your nanny, um, they uh, were, uh, understandably, were trying to find out what she knew about it. This committee had no way to reach her except through you. Is that Mr. Clemens? Right, Mr. Clemens? That's correct. We could never have interviewed her had you not intervened for us and found her. Is that correct? That's correct. And for her, her English, as I understand it, is not that good. Is that correct? It's not that good. That's and adequate. she's probably never testified before a congressional committee or in congressional investigators before either. Never. So um, understandably would be reluctant to do that. Uh, can you just give us the circumstances of your, uh, obviously if you hadn't contacted her, we probably never would have been able to find her and, and been able to interrogate her. Can you just give us from your perspective how you contacted her, what meetings, and uh, what, what was said at that point so we can put this into an appropriate perspective? Yes, Mr. Congressman. Um, uh, I was told on Friday that uh, our, our nanny or sitter at the time, uh, back at that time period, was wanting to, uh, that they wanted to talk to her. And um, I reached out to her and, and uh, made the phone call, and uh, that was it. I haven't talked to her in I, I don't know uh, how many years it's been, but we hadn't talked to her since. And uh, I know when she came to the house, uh, it was great to see her. We ain't seen her in a long time, and that's basically the conversation. I said that um, uh, we're all trying to remember some kind of uh, uh, party at Conseco's uh, house. I know that I golfed at that house, and um, I golfed, and then we uh, uh, had a golf game. And I'm 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 not uh, totally positive that I wouldn't have taken back my wife and dropped her off at the house. Uh, I I believe that the nanny. Uh, was uh, there with my kids. They sure could have been. Uh, they could have gone over there in the afternoon after the party. But, but I, was, I was focused on what I was asked, Congressman, was a, about attending a party. A barbecue. I, so, uh, a barbecue in particular, right? A bar, yeah, a barbecue or a luncheon or something of that nature. So uh, 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 could, could I have gone by the house uh, later that afternoon and dropped uh, my wife or her brother-in-law, the people that golfed with me? Sure, I could have. But uh, at the time of the day that I would uh, uh, express it to be, um, I was on my way to the ballpark. I would have gotten to the ballpark extremely early. This was I, like I know. I know one thing. I wasn't there having huddled up with somebody trying to uh, do a drug deal. Right. I know that for sure. And this was what eight years ago, nine years ago. Yes. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. McMe. Let me ask you: Did you ever use Roger Clemens' likeness without his permission? No. Have you ever obtained a doctorate uh, degree from a college or university? Yes. Can you explain it to us, how you obtained it? I obtained it when I was in Toronto in, uh, at the end of 98. And it was a situation where the, uh, at the time I was living in Toronto, so I was looking for something I can do correspondence-wise. And I applied to several different colleges at the time, and I got accepted to Columbus University in Maryland, Louisiana, and started to get take courses in accordance to nutritional counseling um, to achieve a PhD in nutritional counseling. How and many courses did you take? It was 11 courses, uh, and upon completion, a dissertation. And I took uh, every course, and what it was was they would mail you the coursework. I would take it, write a thesis paper at the end of the, the, the uh, at the end of when I finished it on my time when I did it as fast as I could do it and submit it and get graded and uh, in, in moving forward to the dissertation work at the end of the coursework. And did you finish? Yes, I did. And did you write a dissertation? Yes, I did. And what was the subject of the dissertation? The subject was uh, weight training, supplementation, and improving miles per hour on a fastball with um, pitchers. I'd like to That'd be an interesting one to read. Have you ever told law enforcement investigators that you held a doctorate in behavioral sciences? Yes. 
It, that's not what your doctorate was in, was it? No, it's behavioral sciences with the, with the concentration in nutritional counseling. Okay. So did you, you held yourself out as a doctor then to, to athletes? PhD. PhD. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the university? Does it have a campus? Um, as I found out later, no, it doesn't. Is this one of what you call a diploma mill to some extent? As I had found out later on, yes, it is. Okay. Um, on the checks you wrote, uh, Kirk Radomsky, and printed in the appendix of the Mitchell Report at page D11, you list yourself as Dr. Brian McNamee. Uh, at that point, uh, you, you still feel you could put, hold yourself out in good faith as a doctor? I'm not, I'm not sure if I follow. Um, on the checks you wrote, uh, Kirk Radomsky, you printed in the appendix there in the Mitchell Report, you list yourself on the checks as Dr. Brian McNamee. This was in good faith. Doctor, you, I mean, you still hold yourself out as a doctor, right? I'm sure that if that was under my business account, then uh, I probably did. It was a business check. Okay. Um, I see my time is up. But let me just ask, did you ask Roger Clemens and Andy, Andy uh, Pettit's permission uh, to use uh, pictures um, in one of your advertisements which promotes McNamee as Dr. Brian McNamee, who is widely recognized for his work with Roger Clemens, Andy Pettit, Jorge Posada, Mike Stanton, and many other star athletes? No, I, I never asked that permission. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Davis on our side. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Clemens, it was a pleasure to meet with you last week. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in your question, you asked whether it was appropriate for Mr. Clemens to meet with his nanny, a fact witness, on Sunday before the committee spoke with her. You did not ask the one lawyer on the panel his view, so I'd like to ask Mr. Sheeler, a former federal prosecutor, is it usual for a client to meet with the fact witness as Mr. Clemens did? Uh, no, that is not usual. Um, I don't know any of the facts and circumstances about uh, these meetings other than what I've heard today. But what I will tell you from my experience is in the course of investigation, what is typical if there is a witness who has potentially relevant information, you have an attorney reach out to that witness or you have an attorney's investigator. What is unusual is to have the direct witness or principal to the controversy reach out to that because that could create the impression that the witnesses are trying to get their stories together or something like that. So I would say by far the most customary practice in a situation like this would you, is you would have the lawyer or the lawyer's investigator reach out to potential witness and try to get the information that witness has and understand it as best you can. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Clemens, uh, on December the 12th, 2007, private investigators who were working for you had a meeting with Mr. McNamee to discuss the upcoming Mitchell report. And although they denied recording the meeting, we now know that they did record it. You used portions of this recording when you filed a defamation lawsuit against Mr. McNamee but you were selective in which portions you made public, and you never released the entire recording. Now the committee has the entire recording of that meeting, and I want to ask you about it. Without knowing he was being recorded, Mr. McNamee told your investigators, one, that he injected you with the steroid Winstraw in 1998, Two, that he injected you with human growth hormone in 2000. And three, that he injected you with other steroids on multiple occasions in 2000 and 2001. Mr. McNamee confirmed to your own investigators virtually all of the facts about your alleged steroid use that were reported by Senator Mitchell. Mr. Clemens, what Mr. McNamee told your investigators in private confirms the basic facts that he told Senator Mitchell. My question is, do you think the fact that Mr. McNamee gave your investigators in private the same account as Senator Mitchell, if that should be viewed as corroboration of his account? I'm not. Uh, sure exactly what all he did tell the investigators. Um, uh, I heard a, uh, what I can recollect is a, a, a tape recording from 
uh, conversation he had with um, Jim Murray um, when I re returned home from vacation. Uh, uh, when I met at Randy Hendricks's house and with uh, Rusty Hardin's group. Yes, um, there's another part of the secret recording that you did not make public, uh, Mr. Clemens. When I read the transcript of the secret recording, I was struck by the fact that your private investigators seemed to be fishing for information about what evidence Mr. McNamee had against you. For example, your investigators asked Mr. McNamee, was there any kind of paper trail documentation on any of this stuff? They asked him also, was anybody ever there when you do this besides you and Roger? Mr. Clemens, why did your investigators uh, ask these questions? I, I, Mr. Congressman, I have um, no idea. I didn't talk to my investigators. They went out and uh, did the investigating. I'm, I, I don't. Uh, oh, okay. I I'm have sorry. one sure. final question about this transcript. One of your investigators asked Mr. McNamee this question. Hypothetically, if Roger Clemens said, that is absolutely BS, none of that ever happened, is there any doubt in your mind that what you told us today is the absolute truth? Mr. McNamee answered, I told you more truth than I told the federal government. The question is, why did your investigators ask Mr. McNamee this question, and what do you make of Mr. McNamee's answer? Congressman, I, again, I have no idea. The investigators were doing that with the um, lawyers. Uh, and again, this man has never given me HGH or growth hormone uh, or steroids of any kind. So. Uh, so you just really don't know and you were not instructing them as they did there. That is correct. I don't, I didn't have, uh, I wasn't a part of that investigation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Duncan. I'm sorry. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling uh, this hearing. And uh, let me say, I think uh, almost everything has been asked and said that could <laughs> could have been asked at this point, so I won't uh, try to de belabor this or delay it much longer, but uh, I, I have heard some holier-than-thou types on television say that Congress has much more important things uh, to deal with, and, you know, I'll say this, we all work on all these other important issues all the time, but uh, a lot of them aren't as glamorous or high-profile as this, and so we don't have uh, some of the crowds that uh, we have, but we're working on the other major issues, too. But uh, I, uh, because of that, I was very interested when I read this comment Sunday, in, uh, this past Sunday in the Parade magazine. It, they had an article, Should Congress Umpire Baseball? And, it's, and they said in that article, it said, quote, federal scrutiny, however, has led to positive changes. After the 2005 hearings, the sport tightened its drug policies and launched an extensive probe. Now Congress is pushing baseball to implement an investigative unit dedicated to steroids, independent drug testing, and better player education. So I think some good things have come out of these hearings. I think it served as a wake-up call to many parents and young athletes around the country because they've heard, I think, for the first time reports of people committing suicides or having uh, legs amputated or having to have psychiatric treatment because of use of steroids. So uh, I think it's been there's been some good in this. One, uh, uh, I did see a report uh, yesterday in the Washington Times in which a legal expert said that uh, uh, the case against Mr. Clemens was very, very weak, and those were his words. And I spent seven and a half years as a criminal court judge trying felony criminal cases before I came to Congress, and I would have to agree, particularly on the syringes. There's, uh, there's all sorts of chain of evidence problems. Uh, I don't think those syringes would be admissible in almost any court in this uh, uh, country. But one, th one thing I'm not clear on, and maybe it's been covered, I've been in and out because of these votes. Mr. Clemens, did you refuse to uh, uh, meet with the uh, Mitchell Commission? Congressman, I was not told um, uh, uh, about to come down and, and uh, visit with uh, uh, Senator Mitchell. Um, he was, again, he was, 
I believe he asked the Players Association is the way that the, um, the process worked. The Players Association then contacts uh, agents. I don't believe any players, uh, from what I understand, uh, maybe Jason Giambi did go down. He had already talked to um, the grand jury or what have you. Um, but no, sir, I was never told uh, uh, by my baseball agent or the uh, uh, Players Association that uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell requested to see me. I, that, those letters or phone calls never came to me. Uh, but once again, if I knew what the lies this man were telling about, I would have been down there to see him in a heartbeat without a question. And I would like to say, again, I got a little emotional. I'm going to, a little emotional in my testimony with the staff. But I'm a public person. I am easy to find. When the commissioner asked me to get myself together to go out there and, and, and the league asked me to put USA on my chest and represent my team, my country, I did everything I could do to get ready. They pushed my date up, tried to get me ready sooner. I told them I could shake hands and wave flags and sell tickets for you if you want to do that. But if you want me on the field, it's going to take me longer to get this body going. And I did, and I went out there, and I, I did the best I, very, I, I, I could possibly do, and I was proud to have the USA on my chest. When a player went down in the All-Star game in Chicago, I happened to be on my All-Star break with my youngest son at a lake house about an hour north of my house in Houston. They found me. This player was hurt. He didn't want to pitch, collect his bonus, but did not want to pitch. They asked me if I would come pitch an inning in this game. I told them, let me talk to my family. But they found me. When all this happened, the former president of the United States found me in a deer blind in South Texas and expressed his concerns that this was unbelievable and that to stay strong and, and keep your, hold your head up high. These people found me. All due respect to Senator Mitchell, I am on the same subject to him with steroids and baseball. But Bud Selig, that league, Bud Selig, could have found me. If he knew that within days what this man said was going to destroy my name, he could have found me. I'm an easy person to find. I'm an easy person to find in the public. Well, well let, me, uh, let me just say this, and I, under, I appreciate everything you just said. Uh, uh, you know, what, you've ended, what they've ended up with is a report based primarily, at least as it applies to, uh, to you, a report uh, based on uh, statements by a man who unfortunately has admitted here several times today that he has lied to law enforcement people and many, many others, and based on information from a man who I understand pled guilty in court and received a five-year sentence this past Friday. That, uh, it seems to me that there may have been uh, some people a little too anxious to uh, get this report out to, uh, and get all the publicity attendant there too. And I, you know, I hate to say those things. I, I spent five and a half years as a bat boy for the Knoxville Smokies baseball team, clubhouse boy, ball chaser, scoreboard operator. I grew up in minor league baseball and there was a bond between bat boys and the trainers. I hate to hear what I've heard from Mr. McNamee today. I think it's a sad thing. Anyway, my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Clemens, didn't you meet with your investigators before the Mitchell report was out and hear what the Mitchell report was going to say? I heard a tape. Uh, that was taped by Jim Murray, uh, and again, I don't know how many days it was um, when I got back. Yes, just I want to clarify. It. Yeah. So you did know before the Mitchell report came out that it was going to talk about you. I found out on a, I believe it. Um, again, I don't know the day or week. Maybe a Wednesday. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask unanimous consent to submit as part of the record Report 9 of the Council on Scientific Affairs from the American Medical Association on Hormone Abuse by Adolescents and also Policy H470.976, the Abuse of Anabolic Steroids, which is an ethical policy of the American Medical Association. And without objection, we will receive it for the record. Mr. McNamee, I was very uh, pleased to hear you admit that you were ashamed for your conduct in this whole affair. Um, I think that this report on uh, hormone abuse by adolescents includes the conclusion that survey data indicates that middle and high school students have been using anabolic steroids 
since the mid-1970s, and national surveys indicate that the use is increasing among high school students, particularly among females. And I find that very disturbing. I got a text message from my 16-year-old son during this hearing because he's homesick and he's watching this on ESPN, like many young people. And the example that you have given by working with highly paid visible professional athletes and encourage them to engage in illegal behavior for the purpose of enhancing their performance is shameful and something that everyone should be condemning. And I hope that you will take the rest of your life going out and educating young people about the dangers of steroid usage. Mr. Clemens, I know we've talked at length about this whole issue of whether or not uh, you have ever taken steroids or HGH, and I'm not going to talk to you about that, but I'm going to tell you very candidly, I am concerned about your testimony about your use of B12 injections and lidocaine, and I'm going to talk to you about that. You testified in your deposition that Mr. McNamee injected you with B12 in Toronto in his weight room and that he injected you without a prescription and you didn't know whether he was even authorized to give those injections. Do you remember that testimony? That is correct. Have you ever been diagnosed with anemia? I have not. Have you ever been diagnosed with senile dementia or Alzheimer's? I have not. Have you ever been a vegetarian? I am not have a vegetarian. Have you ever been a vegan? I'm sorry? A vegan. Uh, I, I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I didn't. Did. <laughs> well, there's a very um, simple explanation why I asked you those questions sure. because the medical literature has indications for B12 injections because most people have B12 occurring naturally in their systems and ingest it all the time from other substances. And the scientific literature is very clear that it is indicated in an injection form only for patients suffering from anemia, low red blood cell counts, or elderly patients who are experiencing senile dementia and Alzheimer's. And the research indicates that some physicians maintain that monthly injections of B12 is required to maintain adequate levels in the elderly and patients with a diagnosed deficiency. You have clearly never been diagnosed with a deficiency, so the question for you is why were you taking it? Oh, my mother in 1988 suggested that I take B12, and, and Congressman, um, uh, I've, my, uh, again, on the professional level, my body's been um, uh, put through the paces. Uh, I was always assumed, and uh, it's, a, it's a good thing, it's not a bad thing. Uh, in the, uh, in, uh, I've, again, I think it's uh, fairly widely used. Um, I, I, again, I take uh, B, B12 in pill form, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I look at it as uh, you know something to it's it's healthy. You also testified that uh, Mr. McNamee uh, gave you chiropractic adjustments. Do you remember that? I do. You were aware that he's not a doctor of chiropractic. Congressman, when I had had my back adjusted in uh, different points of my career, uh, I've had some chiropractors that have given me uh, uh, what I would explain, I would uh, put it this way, when I would lay down on the table on the, with a couple of the chiropractors, I would hope that my lower back did adjust or crack, if you will. If it didn't the first time, the guy I, it was either embarrassed or something, but he jumped on me like he was trying to start a Harley Davidson. Uh, that's how hard it was. I explained this to Brian McNamee. He said, I should be doing that for you. Uh, again, another trusted guy who had a PhD, and um, I had no reasons not to trust him. I, uh, uh, just like other trainers and doctors and physicians, that's... Well, that's what I'm trying to get to. You also testified he gave you a lidocaine injection in your low back when you were having low back problems. Do you remember that? That's correct. Did he ever have you, did he ever administer a test dose of lidocaine before he gave you the full dosage? The amount that he gave me uh, did give me comfort. Did That's he give you, did he have you hooked up to an EKG monitor when he gave you that dosage? No, he did not. See, the problem I'm having, Mr. Clemens, is these are medical procedures we're talking about, regulated professional activities, and you're getting treatments from someone who has no medical licensure to even administer these injections or to perform chiropractic care. And I guess I have a question as a highly paid professional athlete, why you would trust your body, which puts food on your table and takes care of your family, to somebody who has no professional training to take care of you? Uh, again, he told me that he was a PhD, and I do trust him. I am a trusting person. Uh, Congressman, uh, uh, I would not 
uh, doubt any of the trainers or doctors that would, uh, I, I would trust them not to harm me, just like you're talking about. I would trust them not to harm my body. Thank Tell, you for your time. Tell time you. has expired. Mr. Issa? Thank you. And following up on that, uh, it seems like PhD must stand for pilot higher and deeper. Uh, isn't it true, Mr. Clemens, that uh, Mr. McNamee was at times paid by professional baseball in addition to work he did for you? That's correct. Okay. So shame on professional baseball with their tens of millions of dollars of experts uh, for doing that. Uh, and quite honestly, for my colleague, yesterday uh, I told the committee in front of a hearing about my mother getting B12 shots from our family physician. Uh, she was premenopausal and simply a little, a little anemic, she thought. And the, uh, uh, the scientist who was the foremost expert we could find on B12 basically told us there's not a really good test for a, a small deficiency. So the truth is, taking it, which cannot hurt you, might help you, and it's not easily tested for. But of course, that was yesterday's hearing. Now we go to today's. I'd like to thank the, uh, the chairman and ranking member for the past work they've done. In looking through the Mitchell report, I find that Throughout the early 80s, under uh, uh, Kuhn, Kuhn and then Peter Uberoff, uh, we had a rampant problem with cocaine and other drugs mm -hmm. being abused, and little or no ramification for it. Years of work went by, and in 2002, they had a major contract negotiation, uh, oddly enough, with the same uh, uh, Don Fear, who was the union negotiator, and they got an agreement with no teeth in it. So it was due to the uh, chairman and ranking members' work in 05 that I believe we can all say that uh, baseball had began cleaning up with real testing and, and real enforcement. And for that, I'm really thrilled. Uh, last, I'm very thrilled that the chairman announced this would be the last hearing on baseball uh, for the time being, and I think that's appropriate. I think we've, we've done our job. But I, since we have the Mitchell report in front of us, and since a portion has been drawn into question, I'd like to focus us back onto the Mitchell report. And I'll start with you, Mr. Clemens. Do you believe, other than the allegations of some areas that you say are incorrect as to you, that as far as you know, the rest of the report is accurate, well done, and reflects the need to clean up baseball? Congressman, um, I have not read the entire Mitchell report, but along the lines that you're speaking, uh, I do believe baseball is going in the right direction. I believe that the testing is, is good, it's, in, it's intrusive. Um, um, I, I wish I could remember the, I believe it was one of the uh, uh, congressmen or women that brought something up that I, I do that was surprising to me that there was a study about uh, the players uh, getting the Ritalin. And right. again, I'm not an expert, but if it's, if it's some type of speed, uh, I think that needs to be possibly looked into. But I do believe that baseball is going in the right direction. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Sheeler, uh, Sh 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 you have read the report, obviously, and are a participant in it. Do you believe that other than this area that we're dealing with today, that your you stand by your report and believe that it is good work? We stand by our report uh, with respect to the entirety of it, yes. Even though uh, Mr. Conseco says that there are material flaws in it and he's, he's presented information, I mean, I, I guess the question is, do you, you're saying you stand by it including allegations by third parties that there are, there are flaws, including video of, of saying that, in a sense, that Mr. Clemens wasn't at a particular place that you say he was at. You don't see that as at least opening the door for some doubt on a small portion of this report. I stand by the report. Okay. With the uh, that, that's fine. And, and to be honest, the part I wanted was you think you did good work. Mr. Clemens thinks, for the most part, you did good work. Mr. McNamee, I, I realize that uh, you're both a principal and a participant. Do you think this report is good, leaving aside for a moment one area of controversy? I believe the report is good. Okay. Now, do you think that the lies you've told repeatedly have called into question the one portion that we're having this hearing on today? Uh, just, just the, the credibility uh, question of you. Has that, has that hurt the ability for the people in this committee to believe this one small portion? No, it shouldn't. Okay. And so you don't believe that, uh, <clears throat> that the numerous lies that you've told and admitted to uh, that uh, uh, Jose Canseco's uh, saying that you're lying about uh, steroid pills being given. Uh, you don't believe that the uh, series of emails in which you uh, repeatedly asked for 
even while it cooperating investigation, asked for an endless series of, uh, of freebies from people on behalf of uh, Roger Clemens. Things like Under Armour all, uh, or Under Armour, uh, where you asked for all sizes, up, big and small, back in 06. In 05, where you, uh, uh, you, know, you said you were suing, contemplating suing, but of course that wasn't a real threat. Or the LA Times in 07. You don't believe that any of those are the reason that although we all agree that this is generally a good report and it closes a sad history, you don't believe that that creates a situation today in which we'd like to close this report without your testimony and without believing you because you don't seem to be believable? You don't see that as, as even remotely possible? The gentleman's time has expired. No. Please answer the question. No, I don't. Okay. Well, shame on you. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Mr. Westmoreland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me start off by saying that two years ago, when this committee held hearings on this issue, I supported that decision because we have jurisdiction over our nation's drug policy. But I think it's important that we be very careful over how we exercise that jurisdiction. And I'm convinced that this hearing today is a shift away from questions about widespread use of steroids in baseball and instead focuses on alleged wrongdoing by individuals. I certainly hope that, hope that in the future be real careful about how it approaches situations like this one because if we called everybody in sports that's ever been accused of doing steroids before this committee, then we would shut this place down and hold nothing but hearings with athletes who have been accused of using performance enhancing drugs. That's not our role in this process and I certainly hope this show trial will teach us that very valuable lesson. The name of our committee is Oversight and Government Reform, and I hope that there are more important things for oversight and reform of this government than alleged bad behavior of individuals. Mr. McNamee, in your opening statement, you indicated that your decision to release the so-called evidence of bloody gauze and pads and syringes, uh, supposedly of Mr. Clemens, was because you believe Mr. Clemens betrayed your trust when he recorded a phone conversation that the two of you had, I believe, on January the 6th of 07. You said just this morning that what angered you most about the recording of that conversation was that the entire country heard about your son's private medical condition. And yet, uh, 15 minutes after making that statement, uh, Ranking Member Davis asked you about that tape phone conversation. He asked you why you repeatedly said, what do you want me to do every time that Mr. Clemens told you that he wanted the truth? You told Congressman Davis that it was because you knew the conversation was being taped. If you knew the conversation was being taped, then why would you talk about the private medical condition of your son? It wasn't so much uh, that I was, could be sure that Roger was taping it, but I didn't know who was listening to it, and I didn't think he would air it on national TV. Well, furthermore, if you knew it was being taped, wouldn't it have been the perfect opportunity to tell Mr. Clemens that you did tell the truth? That instead of saying repeatedly, what do you want me to do, you would have said, Roger, I've told them the truth. I mean, isn't this a conversation that you were having with Mr. Clemens about what the truth really was? The conversation was for him to call my son. Sir? I, I didn't call, I didn't need to speak to Mr. Clemens. I asked him to call my son. Conversation, he asked me to call his office. I called his office with the hopes that he would call my son. But during that conversation, uh, you did ask him what you wanted, what did he want you to say, and did he not tell you that he wanted you to tell the truth? As I, I said to, um, in the original statement, that I, I did in my own way as I speak. And if you had known me, you would have known what I meant to the answer to that question. It is what it is. The truth is the truth. So what I said was the truth. What you said was the truth, but you never told Mr. Clemens that what you said was the truth. When he asked you to tell the truth, why didn't you just say in plain English so everybody could have understood you? That if, if I had known he was going to air it on national TV, I would have said I did tell the truth. But as far as him taping a conversation, and releasing personal information on my son. I, I wouldn't have said that if I knew it was going to be aired on national TV, and I would, have, I would have said I did tell the truth, but it is what it is. It depends on if you 
is what what is means, I guess. Um, Mr. McNamee, when uh, when you first spoke to the government about this matter, did uh, they threaten to prosecute you for dealing drugs or maybe practicing medicine without a license? No, sir. They did not. When you first spoke with the government about this case, did they tell you that they already knew that Roger Clemens used steroids or uh, human growth hormones? No, sir. When you first spoke to the government about this case, did they pressure you into saying that Roger Clemens used steroids or human growth hormones? Not so ever. Mr. Clemens, um, you have said publicly that baseball should have done more to give you a chance to address these allegations. And I just heard some more of that a while ago. And Senator Mitchell sent a letter to the Players Union uh, advising that there were uh, been allegations made against you for use of performance enhancing substances between 1998 and 2001. Number one, I think you've explained why you didn't respond because they didn't try to get in touch with you. But is there something more that baseball should have done to respond to this and to inform the players that were mentioned in the book uh, that this was going to come out? Well, I, I, from my understanding that they made a, uh, the, the Mitchell people made a phone call back to Mr. McNamee to go down the list of everything that he said. And again, um, uh, it, my stance is I believe baseball is doing the right thing. I think with our testing and everything is going in the right directions. Um, um, I, again, Mr. Mitchell, uh, what it says in the report, I was not made aware that he wanted to speak to me. Uh, well, Mr. Clemens, is it fair to say that uh, Mr. Selig or, or somebody from the Players Union would have known how to get in touch with you? Without question. I alluded that, uh, Mr. Congressman, early about uh, how I felt about that. And um, once again, I, I believe uh, being one of the more visible players in the game over the, the last years, uh, that that courtesy would have been extended to me. The gentleman's time has Mr. expired. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Well, Mr. Sheila, we've given uh, Mr. McNamee and Mr. Clemens an opportunity to uh, discuss some of the, what we saw as inconsistencies. I want to talk to you for a second. In a defamation suit that was filed by Mr. Clemens, he criticized the investigative tactics of, uh, of your investigative tactics. He alleged that the interview of Mr. McNamee was conducted like a Cold War interrogation. He says that a federal agent just read Mr. McNamee's previously obtained witness statement and had Mr. McNamee confirm each statement. The implication was that you didn't question Mr. McNamee to assess his credibility. Mr. Clemens's lawyers made this claim. They said, our understanding is in the only in-person interview of the chief accuser, Brian McNamee, it is our understanding that the prosecutors who made the deal asked the questions in front of Senator Mitchell. They indeed asked leading questions and simply asked McNamee to affirm what he had previously said. So in essence, he was on a short leash with those who had, of course, challenged and can take away his liberty. We have no reason to believe whatsoever, maybe we're wrong, that Senator Mitchell's people asked questions, that they asked questions in a setting that was really conducive for McNamee to lay out what really happened, as opposed to the prosecutors themselves asking it. What is your response to that, Mr. Sheila? That account is absolutely incorrect. We interviewed Brian McNamee three times. The first interview occurred in July 2007. It was at Senator Mitchell's law office in New York. Present were Mr. McNamee's counsel, Senator Mitchell and members of his staff, including me, as well as some federal law enforcement officials. At the very outset of the interview, Mr. McNamee was informed that he faced criminal jeopardy only if he failed to tell the truth. Senator Mitchell could not have been more clear in following up on that saying that all Senator Mitchell wanted was the truth and the complete truth. After that introduction, Senator Mitchell asked the lion's share of the questions and the interview with Mr. McNamee proceeded much as many of the other 700 plus interviews that we conducted what were just seeking to find the truth. I occasionally asked a question, federal law enforcement officials occasionally asked a question. But for the most part, it was Senator Mitchell do doing the questioning, and he made clear he wanted the truth, and the federal law enforcement officials made clear that Mr. McNamee faced criminal jeopardy if he failed to tell the truth. There was then a second interview by phone in October 2007. Again, these same warnings uh, were provided to Mr. McNamee. And again, we went over the information. 
Finally, there was a third interview in November 2007. At that time, I read to him the statements in the draft report which we had attributed to Mr. McNamee to make sure that they were 100 percent accurate. We told him at that time, this is what we understood he had told us before, if there was any corrections, we wanted it corrected because we wanted the information to be 100 percent accurate as best he could recall. He made a couple of minor uh, corrections immaterial to these proceedings, and then we went forth from there. So just so that we're all clear on this, at the first in-person interview, uh, Senator Mitchell was not just reading questions from a transcript of something that had transpired between the Federal investigators and Mr. McNamee. He actually created his own questions and asked those. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. Uh, I'm, not, I'm just going to wrap up. I don't have any more questions on this. Obviously, this is a hearing to try and assess uh, the um, efficacy of that Major League Baseball report. And, and we've all tried, I think, certainly I have tried to come here with an open mind and provide everybody an opportunity to address what seem to be apparent inconsistencies in a lot of the testimony. Uh, we've heard the questions about those inconsistencies. Uh, some of the troubling things are still out there. I'm mindful that Mr. Knobloch confirmed Mr. McNamee's statements, that Mr. Pettit confirmed them, that in contemporaneous conversations apparently that Mr. Pettit had with his wife, uh, she confirms that those conversations with Mr. Pettit occurred. Uh, some of the questions about Mrs. Clemens taking the HGH and having side effects and no follow-up on that. Uh, I just think there's a lot of open questions, Mr. McNamee's uh, credibility as well on this. We're going to have to go back to the record and, uh, and, and take a look at all the transcripts on this thing to, to make a decision. Uh, I do make note, though, Mr. Chairman, it, it made an opportunity for people not to have a hearing on this. I hope that the hearing that now has transpired has satisfied all of the witnesses here that they've had their opportunity to address any of the inconsistencies or uncertainties. I thank the Chairman for conducting the hearing and Mr. Davis for uh, his participation and cooperation as well and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Mr. Uh, Chairman? I have a yes, parliamentary uh, inquiry. Yes. I have a, that, um, that uh, both Mr. Burton and Mr. Westmoreland uh, and much of the national public, uh, when they heard the uh, uh, taped uh, uh, conversation live on national TV, heard this expression, it is what it is, uh, and uh, none of us are prototypical New Yorkers. Uh, I actually asked a New Yorker on the floor, uh, and he said that is a, a not only Mr. McNamee expression, a New York expression, for I told the truth. Would it be appropriate in the record to have some discussion of that phrase because it's a very pivotal phrase that has been nationally debated. And well, we'll hold the record open if you want to submit some uh, documentation uh, and we'll, whatever it is, it is, we'll put in the record. <laughs> Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this. I, I have said to the Chairman myself personally that I am very concerned with the direction this committee has gone in the last year or so because I think we've been playing gotcha games and I don't agree with that. I think there are billions of dollars being wasted every minute <clears throat> by the federal government and what this committee ought to be doing is looking, doing government oversight and we're not doing that. I am not a fan of holding these hearings on issues we have no business dealing with. However, I think since we're here it's important to try to get some questions answered, but I really wish we would get back to what our job is, which is government oversight and accountability. I'd like to ask you, Mr. McNamee, a couple of questions, and then, Mr. Clemens, I'd like to ask you a couple. Mr. McNamee, are you planning on trying to make money off of this situation? No, I'm not. Are you writing a book, or do you plan to write a book? No, ma'am. You don't have any uh, deals in the work with book publishers at all? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we'll see. Um, Mr. Clemens, I'm sorry uh, and I apologize to all three of the witnesses that we've been pulled out to go vote and I have not been here for all of the testimony and I apologize for that, but I thank you all for, um, for spending your time here. Um, well, let me go back. Mr. McNamee, I want to ask you one more question. In the Mitchell report, you say that Mr. Clemens used HGH in 2000, but that he didn't want to use it again because he didn't like it. If that's the case, why would he possibly want to have his wife injected with it, which is what you've alleged? Uh, I just, he asked me to instruct her on how to do it. She continued to use it on her own. and. 
I, you have, you're asking the wrong person. Okay. Congresswoman, if I may, uh, my wife uh, has been coming to question here. Can I, can I read a statement from my, my, from my wife, please? Certainly. If I, if I may. This is from Debbie Clemens, my wife, who is here in the room with me. I'm not sure of the dates, but I read a news article about the benefits of ho growth hormone. During that same week, same week, talking about the subject openly, Brian McNamee, who was at our house in Houston training people, approached me to tell me about the article. She said, he said it was not illegal and used for youthfulness. The next mid-morning, he said he had, so he had some and would be able to give me a test shot. He gave me one shot. He later left the house on his way to the airport. During that time, Roger was not at home, and I didn't have the opportunity to tell him about it later that evening when he arrived home. In telling Roger about that that evening, I was also having circulation problems with itching. It happened the following night, just not as bad. I was very comfortable in trying it, but it was a harmless act on my part. Also, since McNamee had a PhD, he was a trusted good trainer. Roger said, let's back off this. Need, we need to know more about it. And she agreed. She really didn't need it. She has been broken up over this for a long time and she said to me now she feels like a pawn amongst his game. I would have never instructed Brian McNamee to give my wife these shots. Once again, I don't know enough about growth hormone. Uh, I would suggest that young kids, kids of all ages, athletics, I don't know enough about it. It doesn't help you. But I also have heard uh, uh, again, different news articles where people for quality of life have used this product. I have learned more about growth hormone in the last month uh, than I ever have known. Uh, I'm offended again that I, that I was instructed, and I think he said earlier it was his instruction earlier in the day, that I instructed him to give my wife growth hormone. Thank you. I have a uh, photo, uh, four photographs here I'd like you to look at. We don't have the exact dates on them, but this photo was taken somewhere around 95 and 96. This one, 98. The one over here between 2000 and 2002, and this one here sometime between 2004 and 2006. Mr. Clemens, um, you know, I am not an expert in any of these issues, but you appear to me to be about the same size in all of those photos. These were taken before the accusations that you took uh, human growth hormones. They were taken during the time that you're accused of taking them and after them. Again, it doesn't appear to me that your size has changed much in these four photos. Perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about your regime of um, conditioning that you go through. I know that you take it very seriously and maybe you'd like to say something about um, how hard you work at keeping yourself in shape and how that would result in the um, stamina and body build that you have. General ladies, time has expired, Thank but if you, you want to answer briefly. Thank you, sir. Congresswoman, yes. Um, when all these false allegations came out about me, I told them to go talk to the trainers and the people around me that, that know me the best. My body didn't change. Uh, I didn't start throwing harder. Um, uh, the fact of the matter is, I, I started locating better as a pitcher. I think this has gotten a lot of mileage of it, uh, out of it. Uh, uh, General Manager in Boston, who will leave his name out of it because he's got a ton of mileage out of this, said that I was in the twi he made a, a, what I feel is a smart aleck uh, comment, a remark, that I was in the twilight of my career. And in that 1996 season when I was in the twilight of my career, I tied my own single season record of 20 strikeouts. I led the league in strikeouts that year. I was in the top 10 in innings pitched in ERA. And if I was in the twilight of my career, I doubt that the Toronto Blue Jays' ownership would have made me the highest paid pitcher in the game of baseball the following year. That following year, 1997, I won the Triple Crown Award, 
of baseball, which is pitch uh, wins, ERA, and strikeouts. And that's before I met Brian McNamee. Once again, it bothers me greatly that he has taken his PhD and gone out, and from what I've learned, he's coached high school kids or uh, college people. He told me Wall Street guys. Mr. Clemens, uh, you don't know whether this is true or not. The question you were asked is, do you have a good regimen for physical exercise? Do you? I Obviously, do, but you've been very successful. I'm sorry? You've been very successful as a baseball player, so you keep yourself in good shape, don't you? Without question. I take a lot of pride in it. It's I, I see that. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Murphy's time now. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all three of you for sustaining yourselves over this long period of time. Um, uh, listen, it, it, it's clear that someone's not telling the truth here, and I don't think I can invent or create any new questions to try to get at that, uh, um, that answer. So I, I just want to step back for a moment and ask a couple questions of Mr. Sheeler and also Mr. Clemens about how we got here and really where we move forward from here. Mr. Sheeler, we had some discussion earlier uh, about the notice that was given to uh, Mr. Clemens and uh, people that work for him. And there certainly seems to be some degree of confusion about uh, who knew, why that information didn't get to Mr. Clemens, why conversations uh, did not happen um, between uh, Mr. Clemens and the committee staff. Uh, can you just address this issue as to how notice was given and uh, why there wasn't potentially a more aggressive effort made to try to get Mr. Clemens to come in uh, and address some of these before his name was uh, included uh, along with the information in the report? Certainly. Um, from the very first day of the investigation, as a matter of fact, the pe press conference in which the investigation was announced, Senator Mitchell made it clear that he would give any person about whom allegations were made an opportunity to respond before anything was printed. As a practical matter, we were informed by Major League Baseball that all communications with current players, such as Mr. Clemens, had to go through the Players Association. Those were the union rules, and we played by the rules. So in the summer of 2007, Senator Mitchell sent a letter to the Major League Baseball Players Association in which he requested the interviews of Roger Clemens and a number of others, and in which Senator Mitchell stated that we had evidence that Mr. Clemens had used performance-enhancing substances during sometime during the period of 1998 through 2001. We received a letter back on August 8, 2007, from the Players Association, in which they stated, the following players have asked us to inform you that they respectfully decline your request for an interview at this time, Roger Clemens and several others. We did not stop there, however. In October 2007, Senator Mitchell, myself, and others had a meeting with mayors, members of the Players Association because the Players Association had stated that they weren't clear on Senator Mitchell's invitation um, that any player who came in would be provided the evidence which was, uh, which had been, or the allegations which had been stated against them, shown any check, shown any money order, shown <laughs> any corroborating evidence, and then be given a full and complete opportunity to respond. So we had that meeting with them in October, and then we sent another letter, Senator Mitchell sent another letter to the Players Association on October 22nd, in which he stated, to be clear, I have been and remain willing to meet with any player about whom allegations of performance enhancing substance use have been made in order to provide those players with an opportunity to respond to those allegations. During the course of any such interview, I will inform the player of the evidence of his use, including permitting him to examine and answer questions about copies of any relevant checks, mailing receipts, or other documents, and give him an opportunity to respond. Five weeks later, Senator Mitchell received another letter from the Players Association indicating that the, the players had been recontacted and he, he said some have been in direct contact with you, with Senator Mitchell, which was accurate, some had. On behalf of the others, we report that they continue to respectfully decline your request. So I would submit that given the limitations which we had, which is to say we were required by the, the uh, collective bargaining agreement to do our communications through the Players Association, we made repeated requests to Mr. Clemens and others, and we got repeated declinations. 
I would also add, we sent a, Senator Mitchell sent a letter to all players, including Mr. Clemens, which, was, which were provided, asking anyone who wanted to come in and provide any information about steroids that they could come in. I, I, I want to turn this over to Mr. Clemens, not on the specific mm -hmm. issue of notice, mm -hmm. uh, not on the specific issue of notice, but this to me, and I think to a lot of baseball fans out there, seems to be another instance in which a lot of people are doubting uh, the strategy and tactics of the players' union. And uh, listening to the testimony that they gave before this committee several weeks ago in which they uh, made a claim, Mr. Fair made a claim essentially that the uh, sole reason for the existence of the players' union was to represent the employment rights of the players, not necessarily uh, to, to, to represent the best interests of baseball. Um, I would be interested, Mr. Clemens, just to get your sense on your opinion of how the Players Association and the union has conducted themselves in this process and, and whether you have criticisms uh, of the Players Association's willingness to sit down at the table because it is going to be their uh, ability uh, to move from these hearings to sit down at the table and solve this that is going to be the legacy uh, of these hearings and this issue going forward. I would be interested in your opinion on that Congressman, issue. Congressman, thank you. I never received any of those letters. Uh, on that topic there. And I, again, I believe the, uh, that baseball, uh, the Players Association, the committee, I think everybody's working in the right direction to clean up our sport, baseball and sports in general. Uh, I think it is very important that uh, there's, we send no message to, to the young kids about that. Uh, and I believe the Players Association is, is well aware of that and I, I believe it's going in the right direction. But Mr. Clemens, you don't think that the Players Association might have had a responsibility to make sure that you were notified that you were being offered a chance to talk to the Mitchell uh, Commission? It seems to me as potentially the highest profile mm -hmm. player that they received notice regarding, they had a little greater obligation than to just tell people that worked for you. I mean, I would, if I were you, I would be angry not just at the people that worked for me, but I'd be pretty angry at the Players Association as well. I, I understand. And from my understanding was they asked Senator Mitchell and his uh, people, staff, what have you, uh, what it was concerning, and they said they would not tell them just to come down. That's what that's what I've I've gotten. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chase. I have a parliamentary inquiry too, yes. if I could. Uh, Mr. Sheeler, I want to get a clarification on something you said, and then ask um, if we can make sure that we have exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You said that you s that Senator Mitchell sent a notice, and these were how I wrote it down. We had evidence that Mr. Clemens had used performance-enhancing drugs or something. But the key word here is evidence. You said we had evidence that he had used it. You didn't say we had allegations that he had used it. Now, I don't know technically evidence allegations, but it seems to me that the that you all had made up your minds before you ever talked to Mr. Clemens. Is that a technical term? We had evidence. Ms. Wouldn't Fox, it that, that, that been really appropriate to uh, use allegations? That isn't a parliamentary uh, inquiry, well, but, let's, but you asked your question. Yes, but it's a great answer. question. Yeah. Well, let me just, just so there's no misunderstanding, let me just quote what the letter said. This is a July 13th, uh, 2007 letter to uh, the uh, General Counsel of the Players Association. We listed a number of players. And for Roger Clemens, we stated, we have received information that this player allegedly used performance enhancing substances sometime between 1998 and 2001 while a member of the Toronto Blue Jays and New York Yankees. Now, there were a number of other players mentioned as well. We Mr. had not Chairman, made uh, up just our, one. our minds. I'm sorry, but we have well, to follow the regular order, and each member has five minutes, and you've had your five minutes. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that this is part of the problem here. You are. I'm sorry to be rude, but I think I've been more than generous, and I don't think it's fair. Other members aren't getting extra time to do that. We're only going one round, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Clemens. I want to come back. Because I've got to tell you that of all the testimony and the things that I've read, and if I had to, if I walked in here and it was even Stephen between you and Mr. Uh, McNamee, I must tell you the person that I believe most is Mr. Pettit. 
you admit yourself that he is a good guy, he's a truthful guy. And there have been a number of things that make his testimony and his deposition and, that, and his affidavit uh, swing the balance over to Mr. McNamee. I got to tell you, and part of it comes from your own words. Now let me go back. Uh, this is about a conversation not regarding HGH, but steroids. Mr. Pettit told us about a conversation that took place in Mr. Pettit's home in 2003, 2004. Mr. Pettit told us that Mr. McNamee said, and I quote, he had gotten steroids for Roger, unquote. Let me read to you from the transcript of the deposition with Mr. Pettit. Question, did you have any reason to think Mr. McNamee wasn't being straight with you about that? Answer, no, I had no reason to think that. Question, were you surprised? Answer, yes, surprised me when he said that. That was the first time I'd ever heard him say anything about steroids. Mr. Clemens, you have stated that Mr. McNamee is lying about the use of steroids. If he is lying now, why would he have told Mr. Pettit in 2003 and 2004 about your use of steroids? Uh, Congressman, I, I have no idea. I, again, Mr. McNamee never told me about Andy Pettit using uh, HGH. I, the, the running theme that I know of is that every time something came up, uh, again, a conversation with Jim Murray, Brian McNamee said, but I'm trying to warn you, but don't tell Roger. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, have, I have no idea. All I'm telling you is if Andy, and Andy Pettit thought that I had used HGH, our relationship was such that he would have come to me. Okay, you told us yes, that several yes, times. Yes, sir. I got you that. I got it. I understand that. Let me, let me go on to this. You know, I've, I've listened to you and I've listened to you carefully. And again, I'm trying to see where to strike the balance. If I've got two people that are hard, you know, they, they're saying opposite things, I'm looking for an independent source to help me look, try to figure out which side to believe. And I got to tell you, one of the most interesting things, and Mr. McNamee said it and it's been borne out in the depositions, is that when McNamee gave testimony about Knobloch and Pettit, those allegations were borne out to be true. And for some reason, your guy, who you admire, who you think is uh, one of the, the greatest guys, an honest guy, and everybody says he's a religious guy, when he, although he, you, when it comes to you, it's a whole nother thing. You, you follow what I'm saying? So you're saying that Mr. McNamee lied about you, but he didn't lie about the other two. How do you explain that? Again, Congressman, I am, I am with certain that when Andy Pettit when Andy Pettit used HGH, why didn't he tell me that he used HGH? I never learned about any of this. I am, Andy and I are close friends. We were plain travel mates. If he misheard me on a subject that I was talking about, some gentleman's using HGH for quality of life, like I stated, then he missed. He misunderstood that. I, I I'm, think I'm telling you in it uh, again that he should have had no doubt in his mind when he came into the locker room when the Mitch report was uh, the L.A. Times report was released about having us implemented in that ordeal. He sat down and looked at me. I still at that my, time did not know. My time is running out. I, I got. I, I, I hear you, but that, my time is running out. That I again. He looked at me, wringing his hands white as a ghost and asked me what are you going to tell him and I told him I'm going out there to tell the truth I didn't use any of this stuff that alone should have took Andy off any kind of wavering or whatever he's well, had. Well again as I said before I've listened to you very carefully and I, I take you at your word and your word is that Andy Pettit is an honest man and his credibility pretty much impeccable your lawyer says the same thing but suddenly, and, and, and the committee gave him time after time after time to clear up his testimony, and he consistently said the same thing on the oath. Not only that, his wife, he goes and tells his wife everything, and then she does an affidavit saying the same thing, but suddenly he, he, he misunderstood you. All I'm yeah. saying is it's hard to believe, it's hard to believe you, sir. 
I hate to say that as a, a you're one of my heroes, but it's hard to believe you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, Mr. Shakes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you and uh, Mr. Ranking Member for uh, beginning these hearings in 2005. I felt uh, the initiation of these hearings were spectacular in the sense that we finally got Major League Baseball to wake up and uh, the other sports as well. They originally uh, refused to come in in 2005 and they said uh, we don't have uh, you know, we have our rules and requirements, but they're not in writing. We found out they were in writing. Uh, then they said it was only a draft. We found it wasn't a draft. Uh, they said uh, that the standard was tough, and we looked at it, and it was you were either suspended or fined, and it was 10 strikes and you were out. And so uh, major uh, improvements have happened since then. I think the value of the Mitchell Report was that it said things were pervasive. But this was not a document where the players had been, for instance, tested. Is that correct? You had no test results of any players uh, that had had performance uh, enhancing drugs. Is that correct, Mr. Sheeler? It's correct that we did not have any test results prior to 2005. In 2005, test results became public, right, but prior I, to that, we did not. But my point is, most of these players, it's accusations, it's slips, and so on. I'm not suggesting. Uh, where there's smoke, there isn't fire. Sure. But this is not a document that sends people to jail. And I, my recollection of Mr. Mitchell's report was he was saying, we got a problem, we need to clean it up. And to start to go back and uh, see about who you prosecute and so on, in his judgment, I think was, you know, you'd be going down in a wrong direction. So now we have a player here, one player. There were 89 players. One player is here, and he's here because everyone in this audience knows he is the icon in baseball. He's what brings all these cameras and all those people out there, in my judgment, were lining up like you're going to a Roman circus, seeing the gladiators fight it out. And so my view of this hearing is this isn't where it's at. It's not where it's at. I mean, for you, Mr. Clemens, it's where it's at because it's your life. For you, Mr. McAmey, I believe some of what you say, but you know, it depends when. I, I view you as a police officer who was a drug dealer. And when I read your comment, to put it in context, the issue of steroids and performance enhancing drugs in baseball was starting to pick up steam in 2000. While I liked and admired Roger Clemens, liked and admired, Roger Clemens, I don't think that I ever really trusted him. Maybe my years as a New York City police officer had made me wary. What a strange comment. If the players I, I didn't ask, excuse I me. I read that comment, and I think maybe a police officer would have made you not want to be a drug dealer. But instead, it made you be wary of him. But I just had that sense that if this ever blew up and things got messy, and they're pretty messy, aren't they? Roger would be looking out for number one. Well, that's understandable. He's going to look out for himself. I viewed the syringes and evidence that would prevent me from being the only fall guy. So congratulations. You're not the only fall guy. Congratulations. I understand okay. your concerns, but as far as your uh, comment about a drug dealer, I only did what players asked, and it was wrong. Mr. McMahon, you are a drug dealer. You may, in the that's end... That's your opinion. No, it's not my opinion. You were dealing with drugs. Okay. You were dealing with illegal drugs. Tell me as a police officer how that isn't not being a drug dealer. That's your opinion? No, it's not my opinion. I'm asking you to tell me. Tell me how it's legal to do illegal things and you not call it what you were. You were dealing in drugs, weren't you? Dealing in them, yes. Were they legal drugs? No, they weren't. Thank you. Will the gentleman yield? I certainly think you would agree that the players that ask him for drugs were also dealing with an illegal I would, substance. and reclaiming my time, that's a good point. If you had 89 players here, I'd feel a lot better about this hearing. But would we just have one. Would the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to yield. Just one more question for you, Mr. McNamee. Sure. Isn't it true that if you were injecting people with drugs, illegal drugs, and that made them perform better, that helped your career as a performance enhancing uh, trainer? And wouldn't it be true that if you couldn't have done as well without drugs, in fact, what you were doing is putting drugs into people to benefit your career? 
And I, please I, don't I just give did me what the they I asked. used to be a cop answer, okay? No, I, I just did what they asked. I didn't. I just do what they ask. You know, that's what every drug pusher says is, is we wouldn't be selling them if there wasn't asking for them. You know, earlier I talked about pilot higher and deeper. I wasn't talking about PhDs who get their degrees through the front door. I was talking about people like you who obtain one through a mill for the purpose of tricking and deceiving people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McNamee, did you deceive anybody when you gave them a shot, or did they know what they were doing? They Mr. Chairman, knew what they were regular doing. order. Huh? Mr. Chairman, Ms. regular Watson? order. Mr. Chairman, he deceived me. Uh -huh. Well, that's your, your opinion, too. Ms. Watson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I do hope that uh, all the witnesses have had a break. This has been going on a long time. Uh, I've listened to the questions. I've listened to the responses. And I really don't know where this hearing is going. But I do hope that there will be something learned with the hours that we have spent listening. And I do hope that there are messages that will come out of this for those who look on our athletes and our celebrities and so on as their heroes and heroines. And Mr. Clemens, um, since you've been the subject of the questioning for the most part, Mr. McNamee, Number one, what did you think about the Mitchell report as a document that represented some research, whether it was in-depth or substantive or not? What did you think about what you read? Congressman, I've always agreed with the Mitchell report. Um, I have disagreements, obviously strong disagreements, with what this man, the claims he's made in that report about me. I've lived my life, I want, I've lived my life knowing that if I ever had the opportunity to chase my dreams and make it to the major leagues, that I would be an example for kids. Not only mine, but the other children. I want them to know that there are no shortcuts, that you have to work hard. When I give these talks to young kids, and I give to, to younger kids, to high school kids, to college kids, who a man was present with me at the University of Kentucky about these college kids, about taking care of your body, your body's your temple. Understand that you're a student athlete, not an athlete student. And then I put this man out in front to also say that same message to them. I want the kids to know that, that with hard work, that you can achieve your goals, whatever it might be. Yes, you are going to fail. You're going to fall down. You're going to stumble. And that's the, the message I try and preach to these kids. But you've got to pick yourself up and go. And I want the kids that are out there listening to that day to understand that, that there are no shortcuts, that steroids are bad for your body. Everything that we've heard about steroids are bad for you. They break you down. I believe it's a self-inflicted penalty. Um, I want the children to know that. Uh, Mr. McNamee, yes. what did you think about the Mitchell report? I think it was a document that needed to be done, and it's not really up to me on what people's opinion of that is. All I know is I told the truth in that document. Uh, as you know, all of you were sworn in. That is what happens in this committee. and. Uh, if you don't speak the truth, and there is evidence that showed that you were not telling the truth, you can be found guilty of perjury. And so what would you like to say to the public? This is all on C-SPAN. There have been at least 100 uh, press people out there, if not more. So this is going out across the nation and probably abroad as well. What would you like to say? not in your own defense, but about that report and about baseball to young people. You're addressing the question to me? Yes. I, I, I think the, the report is maybe the first chapter in maybe a bigger document that would have to disclose more information on how, how much this, this really was involved, the drug use in baseball was involved, 
And as far as young people, uh, we really need to address that deeper in the roots of, of the younger people's coaching staffs and the parents. We need to educate parents what to look for. We need to educate high school coaches, youth ball coaches. We need to educate the college coaches. Major league players, they're adults. They're going to make adult decisions. You have to get the root of the problem. All you did was, all, all, all the Mitchell Port would did, it did was scratch the surface of a much larger problem, but at least it started it. It's chapter one. So it's up to you guys. We're sitting here now. Let's go back down to the grassroots of where baseball started. If you want to get into the high school and the colleges and the youth balls, let's educate the trainers, let's educate the fathers, the mothers, the babysitters, let's educate everybody about the signs of what to look for and what, what's going to be encouraging to these people as alternative um, methods. Let me just ask you this. My time is running out. There were some pretty harsh things said just a few minutes about you. And what would you say about your own involvement in all of this as a trainer? What, how would you describe your involvement? Well, my involvement, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm not proud of it, and I wish I wasn't here, but I am. So th there's got to be something good that comes out of this, and hopefully it'll start happening after this meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Ms. Watson. That uh, concludes our questioning and our testimony. I want to uh, recognize Mr. Davis for a concluding statement. Um, oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank uh, the witnesses. It's been a, a long day, and I'm sure there were other things you would have preferred to have done today. Um, but let me just say that um, the underlying report by uh, Senator Mitchell, I think, remains largely intact. There is this bone of contention on this particular item that I think we've tried to give some focus to today that I think will have, um, d doesn't in any way, shape, or form, uh, I think, take away from the underlying um, recommendations that the report has made. As far as uh, this goes today, this has been, I think, a robust discussion, uh, a lot of questions at issue, um, and uh, I guess history will, will judge that. Mr. Waxman and I will talk about how we handle it from here, but I, I want to thank both witnesses uh, for being here. Uh, I think some, uh, you know, I have my own opinions on this, but I think so, so do probably the viewing audience. Our goal when we started this was to send out the message that steroid use was dangerous, it was wrong, it was illegal, and you had a million kids taken. Major League Baseball has changed their policies, and we're hoping they'll change them again in light of the Mitchell recommendations. And it's good to hear the one thing you agree on is that you agree with that underlying recommendation. So I want to thank you both for coming here today, and uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. We've worked together on this whole issue from the very beginning in 2005 when you were chairman, now that I'm chairman, and this is not anything that separates us as Democrats or Republicans. We all care about this issue. Uh, each member and perhaps everyone in the audience that watches this hearing will reach uh, his or her own conclusion. But this is what I think we've learned. Chuck Knobloch and Andy Pettit confirmed what Brian McNamee told Senator Mitchell. We learned of conversations that Andy Pettit believed he had with Roger Clemens about HGH. And even though Mr. Clemens said his relationship with Mr. Pettit was so close that uh, they would know and share information with each other, evidently Mr. Pettit didn't believe what Mr. Clemens said in that 2005 conversation. Doesn't mean he was mis just, not mistaken, sir. Doesn't mean that, uh, it but does he not mis It does not mean that he was not mistaken, Excuse sir. Excuse me, but this is not your time to argue with me. Evidently, he didn't believe it in your second conversation because he went ahead and issued a uh, statement to us, as did his wife. Mr. McNamee, you've taken a lot of hits today. In my view, some were fair and some were really unwarranted. There will be some members who will focus on your inconsistencies, but as Mr. Souter pointed out, that may not be unusual in these types of situations. I want you to know, though, and as chair of this committee, I appreciate all your cooperation with our investigation, and I want to apologize to you for some of these comments that were made. The rules do not allow us to comment on each other when we have time that's yielded, and a member can say whatever he or she wants in that five or ten minute period of time. Uh, I think uh, uh, people who look at this whole question will not just look at the conflict of testimony between the two of you, but others who express views on this matter as well. But let me end by saying 
that we started this investigation on baseball to try to break that link of professional sports and the use of these drugs. And we don't want to look at the past any longer in baseball, and we didn't even want this hearing today, as I indicated in my opening. We want, in the future, to look at making sure that we don't have steroids, and human growth hormone, and other dangerous drugs used by professional sports who are role models to our kids because we're seeing the culture of the clubhouse become the culture of the high school gym. Uh, that concludes our hearing today, and we stand adjourned. Thank you. On tomorrow's Washington Journal, Shell Oil President John Hoffmeister on foreign oil dependence. Also, Representative Randy Forbes on military.